Audio Literature presents Don Juan, A Yaqui Way of Knowledge, by Carlos Castaneda, read by Peter Coyote. In the summer of 1960, while I was an anthropology student at the University of California, Los Angeles, I made several trips to the Southwest to collect information on the medicinal plants used by the Indians of the area. The events I describe here began during one of my trips. I was waiting in a border town for a Greyhound bus, talking with a friend who had been my guide and helper in the survey. Suddenly he leaned toward me and whispered that the man a white-haired old Indian who was sitting in front of the window, was very learned about plants, especially peyote. I asked my friend to introduce me to this man. My friend greeted him, then went over and shook his hand. After they had talked for a while, my friend signaled me to join them, but immediately left me alone with the old man, not even bothering to introduce us. He was not in the least embarrassed. I told him my name, and he said that he was called Juan, and that he was at my service, He used the Spanish polite form of address. We shook hands at my initiative and then remained silent for some time. It was not a strained silence, but a quietness, natural and relaxed on both sides. Though his dark face and neck were wrinkled showing his age, it struck me that his body was agile and muscular. I then told him that I was interested in obtaining information about medicinal plants. Although in truth I was almost totally ignorant about peyote, I found myself pretending that I knew a great deal and even suggesting that it might be to his advantage to talk with me. As I rattled on, he nodded slowly and looked at me, but said nothing. Finally, after what seemed a very long time, Don Juan got up and looked out of the window. His bus had come. He said goodbye and left the station. I was annoyed at having talked nonsense to him and at being seen through by those remarkable eyes. When my friend returned, he tried to console me for my failure to learn anything from Don Juan. He explained that the old man was often silent or noncommittal, but the disturbing effect of this first encounter was not so easily dispelled. I made a point of finding out where Don Juan lived and later visited him several times. On each visit, I tried to lead him to discuss peyote, but without success. We became nonetheless very good friends and my scientific investigation was forgotten or was at least redirected into channels that were worlds apart from my original intention. The friend who had introduced me to Don Juan explained later that the old man was not a native of Arizona where we met, but was a Yaqui Indian from Sonora, Mexico. At first I saw Don Juan simply as a rather peculiar man who knew a great deal about peyote and who spoke Spanish remarkably well. But the people with whom he lived believed that he had some sort of secret knowledge, that he was a brujo. The Spanish word brujo means in English medicine man, curer, witch, sorcerer. It connotes essentially a person who has extraordinary and usually evil powers. I had known Don Juan for a whole year before he took me into his confidence. One day he explained that he possessed a certain knowledge that he had learned from a teacher a benefactor, as he called him, who had directed him in a kind of apprenticeship. Don Juan had, in turn, chosen me to serve as his apprentice, but he warned me that I would have to make a very deep commitment and that the training was long and arduous. My notes on my first session with Don Juan are dated June 23, 1961. That was the occasion when the teachings began. I had seen him several times previously in the capacity of an observer only. At every opportunity, I had asked him to teach me about peyote. He ignored my request every time, but he never completely dismissed the subject, and I interpreted his hesitancy as a possibility that he might be inclined to talk about his knowledge with more coaxing. In this particular session, he made it obvious to me that he might consider my request, provided I possessed clarity of mind and purpose in reference to what I had asked him. Would you teach me about peyote, Don Juan? Why would you like to undertake such learning? I really would like to know about it. It is not just to want to know a good reason. No. You must search in your heart and find out why a young man like you wants to undertake such a task of learning. Well, why did you learn about it yourself, Don Juan? Why do you ask that? 
Well, maybe we both have the same reasons. I doubt that. I'm an Indian. We don't have the same paths. The only reason I have is that I, I want to learn about it, just to know. But I assure you, Don Juan, my intentions are not bad. I believe you. I've smoked you. I beg your pardon? It doesn't matter now. I know your intentions. Do you mean you saw through me? You could put it that way. Well, will you teach me then? No. Is it because I'm not an Indian? No. It's because you don't know your heart. What is important is that you know exactly why you want to involve yourself. Learning about mescalito is a very serious act. If you were an Indian, your desire alone would be sufficient. Very few Indians have such desire. Sunday, June 25th, 1961. I stayed with Don Juan all afternoon on Friday. I was going to leave about 7 p.m. We were sitting on the porch in front of his house, and I decided to ask him once more about the teaching. It was almost a routine question, and I expected him to refuse again. I asked him if there was a way in which he could accept just my desire to learn, as if I were an Indian. He took a long time to answer. I was compelled to stay because he seemed to be trying to decide something. Finally, he told me that there was a way, and proceeded to delineate a problem. He pointed out that I was very tired sitting on the floor, and that the proper thing to do was to find a spot, sitio, on the floor where I could sit without fatigue. I had been sitting with my knees up against my chest and my arms locked around my calves. When he said I was tired, I realized that my back ached and that I was quite exhausted. I waited for him to explain what he meant by a spot, but he made no overt attempt to elucidate the point. I thought that perhaps he meant that I should change positions, so I got up and sat closer to him. He protested my movement and clearly emphasized that a spot meant a place where a man could feel naturally happy and strong. He patted the place where he sat and said it was his own spot, adding that he had posed a riddle I had to solve by myself without any further deliberation. He got up and very sternly warned me that it might take me days to figure it out, but that if I did not solve the problem, I might as well leave, because he would have nothing to say to me. He emphasized that he knew where my spot was, and that therefore I could not lie to him. He said this was the only way he could accept my desire to learn about mescalito as a valid reason. He added that nothing in his world was a gift, and that whatever there was to learn had to be learned the hard way. He went around the house to the chaparral to urinate. He returned directly into his house through the back. I thought the assignment to find the alleged spot of happiness was his own way of dismissing me, but I got up and started to pace back and forth. I got tired of walking and sat down. After a few minutes I sat somewhere else, and then at another place, until I had covered the whole floor in a semi-systematic fashion. I deliberately tried to feel differences between places, but I lacked the criteria for differentiation. I lay down on my back and put my hands under my head like a pillow. Then I rolled over and lay on my stomach for a while. I repeated this rolling process over the entire floor. For the first time I thought I had stumbled upon a vague criterion. I felt warmer when I lay on my back. I rolled again, this time in the opposite direction, and again covered the length of the floor, lying face down on all the places where I had lain face up during my first rolling tour. I experienced the same warm and cold sensations depending on my position, but there was no difference between spots. Then an idea occurred to me which I thought to be brilliant. Don Juan's spot. I sat there and then lay, face down at first and later on my back, but the place was just like all the others. I stood up. I had had enough. I wanted to say goodbye to Don Juan, but I was embarrassed to wake him up. I looked at my watch. It was two o'clock in the morning. I had been rolling for six hours. At that moment, Don Juan came out and went around the house to the chaparral. He came back and stood at the door. I felt utterly dejected, and I wanted to say something nasty to him and leave, but I realized that it was not his fault, that it was my own choice to go through all that nonsense. I told him I had failed. I had been rolling on his floor like an idiot all night and still couldn't make any sense of his riddle. He laughed. He said that it did not surprise him because I had not proceeded correctly. I had not been using my eyes. Well, that was true, yet I was very sure he had said to feel the difference. 
I brought that point up, but he argued that one can feel with the eyes when the eyes are not looking right into things. As far as I was concerned, he said, I had no other means to solve this problem but to use all I had, my eyes. He went inside. I was certain that he had been watching me. I thought there was no other way for him to know that I had not been using my eyes. I began to roll again because that was the most comfortable procedure. This time, however, I rested my chin on my hands and looked at every detail. After an interval, the darkness around me changed. When I focused on the point directly in front of me, the whole peripheral area of my field of vision became brilliantly colored with a homogeneous greenish yellow. The effect was startling. I kept my eyes fixed on the point in front of me and began to crawl sideways on my stomach, one foot at a time. Suddenly, at a point near the middle of the floor, I became aware of another change in hue. At a place to my right, still in the periphery of my field of vision, the greenish yellow became intensely purple. I concentrated my attention on it. The purple faded into a pale but still brilliant color which remained steady for the time I kept my attention on it. I marked the place with my jacket. Perceiving the hues had been so startling that I was sure it was a criterion of some sort, and perhaps there were other changes to be detected. Anyway, it was too late to leave, so I sat down, stretched my legs back, and began all over again. During this round, I moved rapidly through each place, passing Don Juan's spot to the end of the floor, and then turned around to cover the outer edge. When I reached the center, I realized that another change in coloration was taking place, again on the edge of my field of vision. The uniform chartreuse I was seeing all over the area turned at one spot to my right into a sharp verdigris. I took off one of my shoes and marked the point, and kept on rolling until I had covered the floor in all possible directions. No other change of coloration took place. I came back to the point marked with my shoe and examined it. It was located five to six feet away from the spot marked by my jacket, in a southeasterly direction. There was a large rock next to it. I lay down there for quite some time, trying to find clues, looking at every detail, but I did not feel anything different. I decided to try the other spot. I quickly pivoted on my knees and was about to lie down on my jacket when I felt an unusual apprehension. It was more like a physical sensation of something actually pushing on my stomach. I jumped up and retreated in one movement. The hair on my neck pricked up. My legs had arched slightly. My trunk was bent forward and my arms stuck out in front of me rigidly with my fingers contracted like a claw. I took notice of my strange posture and my fright increased. I walked back involuntarily and sat down on the rock next to my shoe. From the rock I slumped to the floor. I tried to figure out what had happened to cause me such a fright. I thought it must have been the fatigue I was experiencing. It was nearly daytime. I felt silly and embarrassed, yet I had no way to explain what had frightened me, nor had I figured out what Don Juan wanted. I decided to give it one last try. I got up and slowly approached the place marked by my jacket, and again I felt the same apprehension. This time I made a strong effort to control myself. I sat down and then knelt in order to lie face down, but I could not lie in spite of my will. I put my hands on the floor in front of me. My breathing accelerated. My stomach was upset. I had a clear sensation of panic and fought not to run away. I thought Don Juan was perhaps watching me. Slowly, I crawled back to the other spot and propped my back against the rock. I wanted to rest for a while to organize my thoughts, but I fell asleep. I heard Don Juan talking and laughing above my head. I woke up. You found the spot, he said. You asked me to teach you about Mescalito, he said. I wanted to find out if you had enough backbone to meet him face to face. Mescalito's not something to make fun of. You must have command over your resources. Now I know I can take your desire alone as a good reason to learn. You really are going to teach me about peyote? I prefer to call him Mescalito. Do the same. Monday, August 7th, 1961. I arrived at Don Juan's house in Arizona about seven o'clock on Friday night. Five other Indians were sitting with him on the porch of his house. I greeted him and sat waiting for them to say something. After a formal silence, one of the men got up, walked over to me, and said, Buenas noches. 
I stood up and answered, Buenas noches. Then all the other men got up and came to me, and we all mumbled buenas noches and shook hands, either by barely touching one another's fingertips or by holding the hand for an instant and then dropping it quite abruptly. We all sat down again. They seemed to be rather shy, at a loss for words, although they all spoke Spanish. It must have been about half-past seven when suddenly they all got up and walked toward the back of the house. Nobody had said a word for a long time. Don Juan signaled me to follow, and we all got inside an old pickup truck parked there. I sat in the back with Don Juan and two younger men. There were no cushions or benches, and the metal floor was painfully hard, especially when we left the highway and got onto a dirt road. Don Juan whispered that we were going to the house of one of his friends, who had seven mescalitos for me. We must have driven for at least an hour before we stopped in front of a small house. It was quite dark and after the driver had turned off the headlights, I could make out only the vague contour of the building. A young woman, a Mexican judging by her speech inflection, was yelling at a dog to make him stop barking. We got out of the truck and walked into the house. The men mumbled, buenas noches, as they went by her. She answered back and went on yelling at the dog. The room was large and was stacked up with a multitude of objects. A dim light from a very small electric bulb rendered the scene quite gloomy. There were quite a few chairs with broken legs and sagging seats leaning against the walls. Three of the men sat down on a couch, which was the largest single piece of furniture in the room. It was very old and had sagged down all the way to the floor. In the dim light it seemed to be red and dirty. The rest of us sat in chairs. We sat in silence for a long time. One of the men suddenly got up and went into another room. He was perhaps in his fifties, tall, dark, and husky. He came back a moment later with a coffee jar. He opened the lid and handed the jar to me. Inside there were seven odd-looking items. This is to be chewed. Esto se masca, Don Juan said in a whisper. I had not realized that he had sat next to me until he spoke. I looked at the other men, but no one was looking at me. They were talking among themselves in very low voices. This was a moment of acute indecision and fear. I felt almost unable to control myself. Don Juan urged me softly, Chew it. Chew it. Masca. Masca. My hands were wet and my stomach contracted. The jar with the peyote buttons was on the floor by the chair. I bent over, took one at random, and put it in my mouth. It had a stale taste. I bit it in two and started to chew one of the pieces. I felt a strong, pungent bitterness. In a moment, my whole mouth was numb. At that moment, the owner of the house got up and invited everybody to go out to the porch. We went out and sat in the darkness. It was quite comfortable outside, and the host brought out a bottle of tequila. The men were seated in a row with their backs to the wall. I was at the extreme right of the line. Don Juan, who was next to me, placed the jar with the peyote buttons between my legs. Then he handed me the bottle, which was passed down the line, and told me to take some of the tequila to wash away the bitterness. The pattern was repeated six times. I remember having chewed six peyote buttons when the conversation became very lively. Although I could not distinguish what language was spoken, the topic of the conversation, in which everybody participated, was very interesting, and I attempted to listen carefully so that I could take part. But when I tried to speak, I realized I couldn't, the words shifted aimlessly about in my mind. I sat with my back propped against the wall and listened to what the men were saying. They were talking in Italian and repeated over and over one phrase about the stupidity of sharks. I thought it was a logical, coherent topic. I had told Don Juan earlier that the Colorado River in Arizona was called by the early Spaniards El Rio de los Tizones, the river of charred wood and someone misspelled or misread Tizones, and the river was called El Rio de los Tiberones, the river of the sharks. I was sure they were discussing that story, yet it never occurred to me to think that none of them could speak Italian. Don Juan brought me a large saucepan. He placed it on the ground next to the wall. He also brought a little cup or can. He dipped it into the pan and handed it to me and said I could not drink, but should just freshen my mouth with it. The water looked strangely shiny, glossy like a thick varnish. I wanted to ask Don Juan about it, and laboriously I tried to voice my thoughts in English, but then I realized he did not speak English. 
I experienced a very confusing moment and became aware of the fact that although there was a clear thought in my mind, I could not speak. I drank. I looked for Don Juan, and as I turned my head, I noticed that my field of vision had diminished to a circular area in front of my eyes. This feeling was neither frightening nor discomforting, but quite to the contrary, it was a novelty. I could literally sweep the ground by focusing on one spot and then moving my head slowly in any direction. I raised my head slightly and saw a medium-sized black dog approaching. I saw him coming toward the water. The dog began to drink. I raised my hand to push him away from my water. I focused my pinpoint vision on the dog to carry on the movement, and suddenly I saw him become transparent. The water was a shiny, viscous liquid. I saw it going down the dog's throat into his body. I saw it flowing evenly through his entire length and then shooting out through each one of the hairs. I saw the iridescent fluid traveling along the length of each individual hair and then projecting out of the hairs to form a long, white, silky mane. At that moment I had the sensation of intense convulsions, and in a matter of instants a tunnel formed around me, very low and narrow, hard and strangely cold. It felt to the touch like a wall of solid tinfoil. I found I was sitting on the tunnel floor. I tried to stand up but hit my head on the metal roof, and the tunnel compressed itself until it was suffocating me. I remember having to crawl toward a sort of round point where the tunnel ended. When I finally arrived, if I did, I had forgotten all about the dog, Don Juan and myself. I was exhausted. My clothes were soaked in a cold, sticky liquid. I rolled back and forth trying to find a position in which to rest, a position where my heart would not pound so hard. In one of those shifts, I saw the dog again. Every memory came back to me at once, and suddenly all was clear in my mind. I turned around to look for Don Juan, but I could not distinguish anything or anyone. All I was capable of seeing was the dog becoming iridescent. An intense light radiated from his body. I saw again the water flowing through him, kindling him like a bonfire. I got to the water, sank my face in the pan, and drank with him. My hands were in front of me on the ground, and as I drank I saw the fluid running through my veins, setting up hues of red and yellow and green. I drank more and more. I drank until I was all afire. I was all aglow. I drank until the fluid went out of my body through each pore and projected out like fibers of silk, and I, too, acquired a long, lustrous, iridescent mane. I looked at the dog, and his mane was like mine. A supreme happiness filled my whole body, and we ran together toward a sort of yellow warmth that came from some indefinite place, and there we played. We played and wrestled until I knew his wishes and he knew mine. We took turns manipulating each other in the fashion of a puppet show. I could make him move his legs by twisting my toes, and every time he nodded his head I felt an irresistible impulse to jump. But his most impish act was to make me scratch my head with my foot while I sat. He did it by flapping his ears from side to side. This action was to me utterly, unbearably funny. Such a touch of grace and irony, such mastery, I thought. The euphoria that possessed me was indescribable. I laughed until it was almost impossible to breathe. I had the clear sensation of not being able to open my eyes. I was looking through a tank of water. It was a long and very painful state filled with the anxiety of not being able to wake up and yet being awake. Then slowly the world became clear and in focus. My field of vision became again very round and ample, and with it came an ordinary conscious act, which was to turn around and look for that marvelous being. At this point I encountered the most difficult transition. The passage from my normal state had taken place almost without my realizing it. I was aware, my thoughts and feelings were a corollary of that awareness, and the passing was smooth and clear. But this second change, the awakening to serious, sober consciousness, was genuinely shocking. I had forgotten I was a man. The sadness of such an irreconcilable situation was so intense that I wept. Saturday, August 5th, 1961. Later that morning, after breakfast, the owner of the house, Don Juan, and I drove back to Don Juan's place. I was very tired, but I couldn't go to sleep in the truck. Only after the man had left did I fall asleep on the porch of Don Juan's house. 
When I woke up, it was dark. Don Juan had covered me up with a blanket. I looked for him, but he was not in the house. He came later with a pot of fried beans and a stack of tortillas. I was extremely hungry. After we had finished eating and were resting, he asked me to tell him all that had happened to me the night before. I related my experience in great detail and as accurately as possible. When I finished, he nodded his head and he said, I think you're fine. It is difficult for me to explain now how and why, but I think it went all right for you. Can you tell me now, Don Juan, how does peyote protect... He did not let me finish. Vigorously, he touched me on the shoulder. Don't you ever name him that way. You haven't seen enough of him yet to know him. How does mescalito protect people? He advises. He answers whatever questions you ask. But then mescalito is real? I mean, he's something you can see? He seemed to be baffled by my question. He looked at me with a sort of blank expression. What I meant to say is that mescalito... I heard what you said. Didn't you see him last night? I wanted to say that I saw only a dog, but I noticed his bewildered look. Well, then you think what I saw last night was him? He looked at me with contempt. He chuckled, shook his head as though he couldn't believe it, and in a very belligerent tone he added, A poco crees que era tu mamá? Don't tell me you believe it was your mama. The word mama was so incongruous that we both laughed for a long time. Then I realized he had fallen asleep and had not answered my question. Sunday, August 6, 1961. I drove Don Juan to the house where I had taken peyote. On the way, he told me that the name of the man who had offered me to Mescalito was John. When we got to the house, we found John sitting on his porch with two young men. All of them were extremely jovial. They laughed and talked with great ease. The three of them spoke English perfectly. I told John that I had come to thank him for having helped me. I wanted to get their views on my behavior during the hallucinogenic experience and told them I had been trying to think of what I had done that night and that I couldn't remember. They laughed and were reluctant to talk about it. They seemed to be holding back on account of Don Juan. They all glanced at him as though waiting for an affirmative cue to go on. Don Juan must have cued them, although I did not notice anything, because suddenly John began to tell me what I had done that night. He said he knew I had been taken when he heard me puking. He estimated that I must have puked thirty times. Don Juan corrected him and said it was only ten times. John continued, Then we all moved next to you. You were stiff and were having convulsions. For a very long time while lying on your back, you moved your mouth as though talking. Then you began to bump your head on the floor, and Don Juan put an old hat on your head and you stopped it. You shivered and whined for hours, lying on the floor. I think everybody fell asleep then, but I heard you puffing and groaning in my sleep. Then I heard you scream and I woke up. I saw you leaping up in the air, screaming. You made a dash for the water, knocked the pan over, and began to swim in the puddle. Don Juan brought you more water. You sat quietly in front of the pan, then you jumped up and took off all your clothes. You were kneeling in front of the water, drinking in big gulps. Then you just sat there and stared into space. We thought you were going to be there forever. Nearly everybody was asleep, including Don Juan, when suddenly you jumped up again, howling, and took after the dog. The dog got scared and howled, too, and ran to the back of the house. Then everybody woke up. We all got up. You came back from the other side, still chasing the dog. The dog was running ahead of you, barking and howling. I think you must have gone twenty times around the house, running in circles, barking like a dog. I was afraid people were going to be curious. There are no neighbors close, but your howling was so loud it could have been heard for miles. One of the young men added, You caught up with the dog and brought it to the porch in your arms. John continued, Then you began to play with the dog. You wrestled with him, and the dog and you bit each other and played. That I thought was funny. My dog does not play usually, but this time you and the dog were rolling on each other. Then you ran to the water, and the dog drank with you, the young man said. You ran five or six times to the water with the dog. Well, how long did this go on, I asked. Hours, John said. At one time we lost sight of you two. I think you must have run to the back. We just heard you barking and groaning. You sounded so much like a dog that we couldn't tell you two apart. 
Well, maybe it was just the dog alone, I said. They all laughed, and John said, You were barking there, boy. What happened next? The three men looked at one another and seemed to have a hard time deciding what happened next. Finally, the young man who had not yet said anything spoke up. He choked, he said, looking at John. Yes, you certainly choked. You began to cry very strangely, and then you fell to the floor. We thought you were biting your tongue. Don Juan opened your jaws and poured water on your face. Then you started shivering and having convulsions all over again. Then you stayed motionless for a long time. Don Juan said it was all over. By then it was morning, so we covered you with a blanket and left you to sleep on the porch. He stopped there and looked at the other men who were obviously trying not to laugh. He turned to Don Juan and asked him something. Don Juan smiled and answered the question. John turned to me and said, We were not going to mention it, but Don Juan says it's all right. You pissed all over my dog. What did I do? You don't think the dog was running because he was afraid of you, do you? The dog was running because you were pissing on him. There was general laughter at this point. I tried to question one of the young men, but they were all laughing, and he didn't hear me. John went on. My dog got even, though. He pissed on you, too. The statement was apparently utterly funny, because they all roared with laughter, including Don Juan. Driving back to Don Juan's place, I asked him, Did all that really happen, Don Juan? Yes, he said. But they don't know what you saw. They don't realize you were playing with him. That is why I did not disturb you. But is this business of the dog and me pissing on each other true? It was not a dog. How many times do I have to tell you that? This is the only way to understand it. It's the only way. It was he who played with you. Did you know all this was happening before I told you about it? He vacillated for an instant before answering. No, I remembered after you told me about it, the strange way you looked. I just suspected you were doing fine because you didn't seem scared. But did the dog really play with me as they say? God damn it, it was not a dog. Sunday, August 20th, 1961. Last night, Don Juan proceeded to usher me into the realm of his knowledge. We sat in front of his house in the dark. Suddenly, after a long silence, he began to talk. He said he was going to advise me with the same words his own benefactor had used the first day he took him as his apprentice. Don Juan had apparently memorized the words, for he repeated them several times to make sure I did not miss any. A man goes to knowledge as he goes to war. Wide awake. With fear. With respect and with absolute assurance. Going to knowledge or going to war in any other manner is a mistake, and whoever makes it will live to regret his steps. Then he said he intended to teach me about an ally in the very same way his own benefactor had taught him. He put strong emphasis on the words very same way, repeating the phrase several times. An ally, he said, is a power a man can bring into his life to help him advise him and give him the strength necessary to perform acts whether big or small, right or wrong. This ally is necessary to enhance a man's life, guide his acts, and further his knowledge. In fact, an ally is the indispensable aid to knowing. Don Juan said this with great conviction and force. He seemed to choose his words carefully. He repeated the following sentence four times. An ally will make you see and understand things about which no human being could possibly enlighten you. Is an ally something like a guardian spirit? It is neither a guardian nor a spirit. It is an aid. The acquiring of an ally required, Don Juan said, the most precise teaching and the following of stages or steps without a single deviation. There are many such ally powers in the world, he said, but he was familiar with only two of them, and he was going to lead me to them and their secrets, but it was up to me to choose one of them, for I could have only one. His benefactor's ally was in La Yerba del Diablo, Devil's Weed, but he said he personally did not like it, even though his benefactor had taught him its secrets. His own ally was in the Umito, the little smoke, he said, but he did not elaborate on the nature of the smoke. He apparently felt there was nothing else he wanted to say. 
He got up and walked toward his house. I told him the situation overwhelmed me. It was not what I had conceived or wanted it to be. He said that fears are natural, that all of us experience them and there's nothing we can do about it. But on the other hand, no matter how frightening learning is, it is more terrible to think of a man without an ally or without knowledge. In the more than two years that elapsed between the time Don Juan decided to teach me about the ally powers and the time he thought I was ready to learn about them in the pragmatic, participatory form he considered as learning, he gradually defined the general features of the two allies in question. He prepared me for the indispensable corollary of all the verbalizations and the consolidation of all the teachings, the states of non-ordinary reality. On Sunday, September 3rd, 1961, I accompanied Don Juan to some nearby mountains where he collected two datura plants from the field. Great care was taken in the harvesting and preparation of the devil's weed. The procedure, which included cutting, mashing, boiling, and leaching the root, was performed with precision and with reverence. Don Juan impressed upon me the absolute necessity for attention in this work, and he assured me that any deviation from the established method could have disastrous consequences. When the final product of this process was presented by Don Juan on Thursday, September 7th, I took it automatically and drank without hesitation. It was somewhat bitter with a pungent odor. It smelled like cockroaches. Almost immediately I began to sweat. I saw a red spot in front of my eyes and the muscles of my stomach began to contract in painful cramps. After a while, even though I felt no more pain, I began to get cold and perspiration literally soaked me. Don Juan asked if I saw blackness or black spots. I told him I was seeing everything red. Everything went fine the other night, he said later. You saw red, and that's all that's important. Next, you must plant a shoot, a brote that I have cut from the other half of the first portion of root. You took half of it the other night, and now the other half must be put into the ground. It has to grow and seed before you can undertake the real task of taming the plant. How will I tame her? The devil's weed is tamed through the root. Step by step, you must learn the secrets of each portion of the root. You must intake them in order to learn the secrets and conquer the power. Power is all right for you now. You are young. You are not an Indian. Perhaps the devil's weed would be good in your hands. You seem to have liked it. It made you feel strong. I felt all that myself. And yet I didn't like it. Can you tell me why, Don Juan? I don't like its power. There's no use for it anymore. In other times, like those my benefactor told me about, there was reason to seek power. Men performed phenomenal deeds were admired for their strength and feared and respected for their knowledge. My benefactor told me stories of truly phenomenal deeds that were performed long, long ago. But now we, the Indians, do not seek that power anymore. Nowadays the Indians use the weed to rub themselves. They use the leaves and flowers for other matters. They even say it cures their boils. But they do not seek its power, a power that acts like a magnet more potent and more dangerous to handle as the root goes deeper into the ground. When one arrives to a depth of four yards, and they say some people have, one finds the seat of permanent power, power without end. Very few humans have done this in the past, and nobody has done it today. I'm telling you, the power of the devil's weed is no longer needed by us, the Indians. Little by little, I think we have lost interest, and now power does not matter anymore. I myself do not seek it, and yet at one time when I was your age, I too felt it swelling inside me. I felt the way you did today only five hundred times more strongly. I killed a man with a single blow of my arm. I could toss boulders, huge boulders not even twenty men could budge. Once I jumped so high I chopped the top leaves off the highest trees, but it was all for nothing. All I did was frighten the Indians, only the Indians. The rest who knew nothing about it did not believe it. They saw either a crazy Indian or something moving at the tops of the trees. We were silent for a long time. I needed to say something. It was different when there were people in the world, he proceeded. People who knew a man could become a mountain lion or a bird or that a man could simply fly. 
So I don't use the devil's weed anymore. For what? To frighten the Indians? Para qué? Para asustar a los indios? And I saw him sad, and a deep empathy filled me. I, I wanted to say something to him, even if it was a platitude. Perhaps, Don Juan, that is the fate of all men who want to know. Perhaps, he said quietly. Thursday, November 23rd, 1961. I didn't see Don Juan sitting on his porch as I drove in. I thought it was strange. I called to him out loud, and his daughter-in-law came out of the house. He's inside, she said. I found he had dislocated his ankle several weeks before. He had made his own cast by soaking strips of cloth in a mush made with cactus and powdered bone. The strips wrapped tightly around his ankle had dried into a light, streamlined cast. It had the hardness of plaster, but not its bulkiness. How did it happen, I asked. His daughter-in-law, a Mexican woman from Yucatan, who was tending him, answered me. It was an accident. He fell and nearly broke his foot. Don Juan laughed and waited until the woman had left the house before answering. Accident, my eye. I have an enemy nearby. A woman... La Catalina. She pushed me during a moment of weakness and I fell. Why did she do that? She wanted to kill me, that's why. Was she here with you? Yes. Why'd you let her in? I didn't. She flew in. I beg your pardon? She's a blackbird, Chanate. And so effective at that. I was caught by surprise. She's been trying to finish me off for a long while. This time she got real close. Did you say she's a blackbird? I mean, is she a bird? There you go again with your questions. She's a blackbird, the same way I'm a crow. Am I a man or a bird? I'm a man who knows how to become a bird. But going back to La Catalina, she's a fiendish witch. Her intent to kill me is so strong that I can hardly fight her off. The blackbird came all the way into my house, and I couldn't stop it. Can you become a bird, Don Juan? Yes, but that's something we'll take up later. Why does she want to kill you? Oh, there's an old problem between us. It got out of hand, and now it looks as if I'll have to finish her off before she finishes me. Are you going to use witchcraft? I asked with great expectations. Don't be silly. No witchcraft would ever work on her. I have other plans. I'll tell you about them someday. Well, can your ally protect you from her? No. The little smoke only tells me what to do. Then I must protect myself. Well, how about Mescalito? Can he protect you from her? No. Mescalito is a teacher, not a power to be used for personal reasons. How about the devil's weed? I've already said that I must protect myself, following the directions of my ally, the smoke. And as far as I know, the smoke can do anything. If you want to know about any point in question, the smoke will tell you. And it will give you not only knowledge but also the means to proceed. It's the most marvelous ally a man could have. Is the smoke the best possible ally for everybody? It's not the same for everybody. Many fear it and won't touch it, or even get close to it. The smoke is like everything else. It wasn't made for all of us. What kind of smoke is it, Don Juan? The smoke of diviners. There was a noticeable reverence in his voice, a mood I had never detected before. I will begin by telling you exactly what my benefactor said to me when he began to teach me about it. Although at that time, like yourself now, I couldn't possibly have understood. The devil's weed is for those who bid for power. The smoke is for those who want to watch and see. And in my opinion, the smoke is peerless. Once a man enters into its field, every other power is at his command. It's magnificent. Of course, it takes a lifetime. It takes years alone to become acquainted with its two vital parts, the pipe and the smoke mixture. The pipe was given to me by my benefactor, and after so many years of fondling it, it has become mine. It has grown into my hands. To turn it over to your hands, for instance, will be a real task for me and a great accomplishment for you if we succeed. The pipe will feel the strain of being handled by someone else, and if one of us makes a mistake... 
There won't be any way to prevent the pipe from busting open by its own force or escaping from our hands to shatter, even if it falls on a pile of straw. If that ever happens, it would mean the end of us both, particularly of me. The smoke would turn against me in unbelievable ways. Well, how could it turn against you if it's your ally? My question seemed to have altered his flow of thoughts. He didn't speak for a long time. The difficulty of the ingredients, he proceeded suddenly, makes the smoke mixture one of the most dangerous substances I know. No one can prepare it without being coached. It is deadly poisonous to anyone except the smoke's protege. Pipe and mixture ought to be treated with intimate care, and the man attempting to learn must prepare himself by leading a hard, quiet life. Its effects are so dreadful that only a very strong man can stand the smallest puff. Everything is terrifying and confusing at the outset, but every new puff makes things more precise, and suddenly the world opens up anew, unimaginable. When this happens, the smoke has become one's ally and will resolve any question by allowing one to enter into inconceivable worlds. This is the smoke's greatest property, its greatest gift, and it performs its function without hurting in the least. I call the smoke a true ally. As usual, we were sitting in front of his house, where the dirt floor is always clean and packed hard. He suddenly got up and went inside the house. After a few moments, he returned with a narrow bundle and sat down again. This is my pipe, he said. He leaned over toward me and showed me a pipe he drew out of a sheath made of green canvas. It was perhaps nine or ten inches long. The stem was made of reddish wood. It was plain, without ornamentation. The bowl also seemed to be made of wood, but it was rather bulky in comparison with the thin stem. It had a sleek finish and was dark gray, almost charcoal. He held the pipe in front of my face. I thought he was handing it over to me. I stretched out my hand to take it, but he quickly drew it back. This pipe was given to me by my benefactor, he said. In turn, I will pass it on to you, but first you must get to know it. Every time you come here, I will give it to you. Begin by touching it. Hold it very briefly at first, until you and the pipe get used to each other. Then put it in your pocket, or perhaps inside your shirt, and finally put it to your mouth. All this should be done little by little in a slow, careful way. When the bond has been established, la amistad está hecha, you will smoke from it. If you follow my advice and don't rush, the smoke may become your preferred ally, too. He handed me the pipe, but without letting go of it, I stretched my right arm toward it. With both hands, he said. What do you smoke, Don Juan? This. He opened his collar and exposed to view a small bag he kept under his shirt, which hung from his neck like a medallion. He brought it out, untied it, and very carefully poured some of its contents into the palm of his hand. As far as I could tell, the mixture looked like finely shredded tea leaves, varying in color from dark brown to light green, with a few specks of bright yellow. He returned the mixture to the bag, closed the bag, tied it with a leather string, and put it under his shirt again. What kind of mixture is it? There are lots of things in it. To get all the ingredients is a very difficult undertaking. One must travel afar. The little mushrooms, los honguitos, needed to prepare the mixture grow only at certain times of the year and only in certain places. What would happen if you should lose or break the pipe? He shook his head very slowly and looked at me. I would die. Are all the sorcerer's pipes like yours? Not all of them have pipes like mine, but I know some men who do. Can you yourself make a pipe like this one, Don Juan, I insisted? Suppose you didn't have it. How could you give me one if you wanted to do so? If I didn't have the pipe, I could not, nor would I want to give one. I would give you something else instead. He seemed to be somehow cross at me. He placed his pipe very carefully inside the sheath, which must have been lined with a soft material because the pipe, which fitted tightly, slid in very smoothly. He went inside the house to put his pipe away. Are you angry at me, Don Juan? I asked when he returned. He seemed surprised at my question. No, I'm never angry at anybody. 
No human being can do anything important enough for that. You get angry at people when you feel that their acts are important. I don't feel that way any longer. Saturday, January 27th, 1962. As soon as I got to his house this morning, Don Juan told me he was going to show me how to prepare the smoke mixture. We walked to the hills and went quite away into one of the canyons. He stopped next to a tall, slender bush whose color contrasted markedly with that of the surrounding vegetation. The chaparral around the bush was yellowish, but the bush was bright green. From this little tree you must take the leaves and the flowers, he said. The right time to pick them is All Souls' Day. El Dia de las Animas. We continued walking, and he picked three different flowers, saying they were part of the ingredients and were supposed to be gathered at the same time. But the flowers had to be put in separate clay pots and dried in darkness. A lid had to be placed on each pot so the flowers would turn moldy inside the container. He said the function of the leaves and the flowers was to sweeten the smoke mixture. We came out of the canyon and walked toward the riverbed. After a long detour, we returned to his house. Late in the evening, we sat in his own room, a thing he rarely allowed me to do, and he told me about the final ingredient of the mixture, the mushrooms. The real secret of the mixture lies in the mushrooms, he said. They are the most difficult ingredient to collect. The trip to the place where they grow is long and dangerous, and to select the right variety is even more perilous. There are other kinds of mushrooms growing alongside which are of no use. They would spoil the good ones if they were dried together. It takes time to know the mushrooms well in order not to make a mistake. Serious harm will result from using the wrong kind. Harm to the man and to the pipe. I know of men who have dropped dead from using the foul smoke. The first time you smoke, I will light the pipe for you. You will smoke all the mixture in the bowl and wait. The smoke will come. You will feel it. It will set you free to see anything you want to see. Properly speaking, it is a matchless ally. But whoever seeks it must have an intent and a will beyond reproach. He needs them, because he has to intend and will his return, or the smoke will not let him come back. Second, he must intend and will to remember whatever the smoke allowed him to see. Otherwise, it will be nothing more than a piece of fog in his mind. Saturday, April 8, 1962. In our conversations, Don Juan consistently used or referred to the phrase man of knowledge, but never explained what he meant by it. I asked him about it. A man of knowledge is one who has followed truthfully the hardships of learning, he said. A man who has, without rushing or without faltering, gone as far as he can in unraveling the secrets of power and knowledge. Can anyone be a man of knowledge? No, not anyone. Then what must a man do to become a man of knowledge? He must challenge and defeat his four natural enemies. The enemies a man encounters on the path of learning to become a man of knowledge are truly formidable. Most men succumb to them. What kind of enemies are they, Don Juan? He refused to talk about the enemies. He said it would be a long time before the subject would make any sense to me. I tried to keep the topic alive and asked him if he thought I could become a man of knowledge. He said no man could possibly tell that for sure. Sunday, April 15, 1962. As I was getting ready to leave, I decided to ask him once more about the enemies of a man of knowledge. I argued that I could not return for some time, and it would be a good idea to write down what he had to say and then think about it while I was away. He hesitated for a while, but then began to talk. When a man starts to learn, he's never clear about his objectives. His purpose is faulty. His intent is vague. He hopes for rewards that will never materialize, for he knows nothing of the hardships of learning. He slowly begins to learn, bit by bit at first, then in big chunks, and his thoughts soon clash. What he learns is never what he pictured or imagined, and so he begins to be afraid. Learning is never what one expects. Every step of learning is a new task, and the fear the man is experiencing begins to mount mercilessly, unyieldingly. His purpose becomes a battlefield. 
and thus he has stumbled upon the first of his natural enemies, fear, a terrible enemy, treacherous and difficult to overcome. It remains concealed at every turn of the way, prowling, waiting, and if the man, terrified in its presence, runs away, his enemy will have put an end to his quest. What will happen to the man if he runs away in fear? Nothing happens to him except that he will never learn. He will never become a man of knowledge. He will perhaps be a bully or a harmless, scared man. At any rate, he will be a defeated man. His first enemy will have put an end to his cravings. And what can he do to overcome fear? The answer is very simple. He must not run away. He must defy his fear, and in spite of it, he must take the next step in learning, and the next, and the next. He must be fully afraid, and yet he must not stop. That is the rule. And the moment will come when his first enemy retreats. But won't the man be afraid again if something new happens to him? No. Once a man has vanquished fear, he's free from it for the rest of his life. Because instead of fear, he's acquired clarity. A clarity of mind which erases fear. By then, a man knows his desires. He knows how to satisfy those desires. He can anticipate the new steps of learning, and a sharp clarity surrounds everything. The man feels that nothing is concealed. And thus he has encountered his second enemy, clarity. That clarity of mind which is so hard to obtain dispels fear, but also blinds. It forces the man never to doubt himself. It is like something incomplete. If the man yields to this make-believe power, he succumbed to his second enemy and will fumble with learning. He will be clear as long as he lives, but he will no longer learn or yearn for anything. But what does he have to do to avoid being defeated? He must do what he did with fear. He must defy his clarity and use it only to see. And the moment will come when he will understand that his clarity was only a point before his eyes. He will know at this point that the power he's been pursuing for so long is finally his. He can do with it whatever he pleases. His ally is at his command. His wish is the rule. He sees all that is around him, but he has also come across his third enemy, power. A man at this stage hardly notices his third enemy closing in on him, and suddenly, without knowing, he will certainly have lost the battle. His enemy will have turned him into a cruel, capricious man. Will he lose his power? No, he will never lose his clarity or his power. Well, what then will distinguish him from a man of knowledge? A man who is defeated by power dies without really knowing how to handle it. Power is only a burden upon his fate. Such a man has no command over himself and cannot tell when or how to use his power. Well, how can he defeat his third enemy, Don Juan? He has to defy it, deliberately. He has to come to realize the power he has seemingly conquered is in reality never his. He must keep himself in line at all times, handling carefully and faithfully all that he has learned. Thus he will have defeated his third enemy. The man will be by then at the end of his journey of learning, and almost without warning he will come upon the last of his enemies, old age. This enemy is the cruelest of all, the one he won't be able to defeat completely, but only fight away. But if the man sloughs off his tiredness and lives his fate through, he can then be called a man of knowledge, if only for the brief moment when he succeeds in fighting off his last invincible enemy. That moment of clarity, power, and knowledge is enough. Don Juan seldom spoke openly about Mescalito. Every time I questioned him on the subject, he refused to talk, but he always said enough to create an impression of Mescalito, an impression that was always anthropomorphic. Mescalito was a male, not only because of the mandatory grammatical rule that gives the word a masculine gender, but also because of his constant qualities of being a protector and a teacher. Don Juan reaffirmed these characteristics in various forms every time we talked. Friday, July 6, 1962. Don Juan and I started on a trip late in the afternoon of Saturday, June 23rd. 
He said we were going to look for honguitos, mushrooms, in the state of Chihuahua. He said it was going to be a long, hard trip. And he was right. We arrived in a little mining town in northern Chihuahua at 10 p.m. on Wednesday, June 27th. We walked from the place I had parked the car at the outskirts of town to the house of his friends, a Tarahumara Indian and his wife. We slept there. The next morning the man woke us up around five. He brought us gruel and beans. He sat and talked to Don Juan while we ate, but he said nothing concerning our trip. After breakfast the man put water into my canteen and two sweet rolls into my knapsack. Don Juan handed me the canteen, fixed the knapsack with a cord over his shoulders, thanked the man for his courtesies, and turning to me said, It's time to go. We walked on the dirt road for about a mile. From there we cut through the fields, and in two hours we were at the foot of the hill south of town. We climbed the gentle slopes in a southwesterly direction. When we reached the steeper inclines, Don Juan changed directions, and we followed a high valley to the east. Despite his advanced age, Don Juan kept up a pace so incredibly fast that by midday I was completely exhausted. We sat down and he opened the bread sack. You can eat all of it if you want, he said. How about you? I'm not hungry, and we won't need this food later on. I was very tired and hungry and took him up on his offer. I felt this was a good time to talk about the purpose of our trip, and quite casually I asked, Do you think we're going to stay here for a long time? We are here to gather some mescalito. We will stay until tomorrow. Where is mescalito? All around us. Cacti of many species were growing in profusion all through the area, but I could not distinguish peyote among them. We started to hike again, and by three o'clock we came to a long, narrow valley with steep side hills. I felt strangely excited at the idea of finding peyote, which I had never seen in its natural environment. We entered the valley and must have walked about 400 feet when suddenly I spotted three unmistakable peyote plants. They were in a cluster a few inches above the ground in front of me, to the left of the path. They looked like round, pulpy green roses. I ran toward them, pointing them out to Don Juan. He ignored me and deliberately kept his back turned as he walked away. I knew I had done the wrong thing, and for the rest of the afternoon we walked in silence, moving slowly on the flat valley floor, which was covered with small, sharp-edged rocks. We moved among the cacti, disturbing crowds of lizards and at times a solitary bird, and I passed scores of peyote plants without saying a word. At six o'clock we were at the bottom of the mountains that marked the end of the valley. We climbed to a ledge. Don Juan dropped his sack and sat down. I was hungry again, but we had no food left. I suggested that we pick up the mescalito and head back for town. He looked annoyed and made a smacking sound with his lips. He said we were going to spend the night there. We sat quietly. There was a rock wall to the left, and to the right was the valley we had just crossed. It extended for quite a distance and seemed to be wider then and not so flat as I had thought. Viewed from the spot where I sat, it was full of small hills and protuberances. Tomorrow we will start walking back, Don Juan said without looking at me and pointing to the valley. We will work our way back and pick him as we cross the field. That is, we will pick him only when he is in our way. He will find us and not the other way around. He will find us if he wants to. Don Juan rested his back against the rock wall and with his head turned to his side continued talking as though another person were there besides myself. One more thing. Only I can pick him. You will perhaps carry the bag or walk ahead of me. I don't know yet. But tomorrow you will not point at him as you did today. I'm sorry, Don Juan. It's all right. You didn't know. Don Juan sat motionless facing the peyote field. A steady wind blew on my face. The twilight is the crack between the worlds, he said softly without turning to me. I didn't ask what he meant. My eyes became tired. Suddenly I felt elated. I had a strange, overpowering desire to weep. I lay on my stomach. The rock floor was hard and uncomfortable, and I had to change my position every few minutes. Finally I sat up and crossed my legs. To my amazement, this position was supremely comfortable, and I fell asleep. When I woke up, I heard Don Juan talking to me. It was very dark. I could not see him well. I did not understand what he said, but I followed him when he started to go down from the ledge. We moved carefully, or at least I did, because of the darkness. 
We stopped at the bottom of the rock wall. Don Juan sat down and signaled me to sit at his left. He opened up his shirt and took out a leather sack, which he opened and placed on the ground in front of him. It contained a number of dried peyote buttons. After a long pause, he picked up one of the buttons. He held it in his right hand, rubbing it several times between the thumb and the first finger as he chanted softly. Suddenly, he let out a tremendous cry. Ahi! It was weird. Unexpected. It terrified me. Vaguely, I saw him place the peyote button in his mouth and begin to chew it. After a moment, he picked up the whole sack, leaned toward me and told me in a whisper to take the sack, pick out one mescalito, put the sack in front of us again, and then do exactly as he did. I picked a peyote button and rubbed it as he had done. Meanwhile, he chanted, swaying back and forth. I tried to put the button into my mouth several times, but I felt embarrassed to cry out. Then, as if in a dream, an unbelievable shriek came out of me. Ay! For a moment, I thought it was someone else. Again, I felt the effects of a nervous shock in my stomach. Don Juan picked up another button and handed me the sack, and the cycle was renewed and repeated until I had chewed fourteen buttons. By this time, all my early sensations of thirst, cold, and discomfort had disappeared. In their place, I felt an unfamiliar sense of warmth and excitation. I took the canteen to freshen my mouth, but it was empty. Can we go to the creek, Don Juan? I repeated the question. My voice sounded as though I was talking inside a vault. Don Juan did not answer. I got up and turned in the direction of the creek. I looked at him to see if he was coming, but he seemed to be listening attentively to something. He made an imperative sign with his hand to be quiet. Abutol is already here, he said. I had never heard that word before, and I was wondering whether to ask him about it when I detected a noise that seemed to be a buzzing inside my ears. The sound became louder by degrees until it was like the vibration caused by an enormous bull roarer. It lasted for a brief moment and subsided gradually until everything was quiet again. The violence and the intensity of the noise terrified me. I was shaking so much that I could hardly remain standing, yet I was perfectly rational. If I had been drowsy a few minutes before, this feeling had totally vanished, giving way to a state of extreme lucidity. The noise reminded me of a science fiction movie in which a gigantic bee buzzed its wings coming out of an atomic radiation area. I laughed at the thought. I saw Don Juan slumping back into his relaxed position, and suddenly the image of a gigantic bee accosted me again. It was more real than ordinary thoughts. It stood alone, surrounded by an extraordinary clarity. Everything else was driven from my mind. This state of mental clearness, which had no precedence in my life, produced another moment of terror. I began to perspire. I leaned toward Don Juan to tell him I was afraid. His face was a few inches from mine. He was looking at me, but his eyes were the eyes of a bee. They looked like round glasses that had a light of their own in the darkness. His lips were pushed out, and from them came a pattering noise. I jumped backward, nearly crashing into the rock wall. For a seemingly endless time, I experienced an unbearable fear. I was panting and whining. The perspiration had frozen on my skin, giving me an awkward rigidity. Then I heard Don Juan's voice saying, Get up. Move around. Get up. The image vanished, and again I could see his familiar face. I'll get some water, I said after another endless moment. My voice cracked. I could hardly articulate the words. Don Juan nodded yes. As I walked away, I realized that my fear had gone as fast and as mysteriously as it had come. Upon approaching the creek, I noticed that I could see every object in the way. I remembered I had just seen Don Juan clearly, whereas earlier I could hardly distinguish the outlines of his figure. I stopped and looked into the distance, and I could even see across the valley. Some boulders on the other side became perfectly visible. I thought it must be early morning, but it occurred to me that I might have lost track of time. I looked at my watch. It was ten of twelve. I checked the watch to see if it was working. It couldn't be midday. It had to be midnight. I intended to make a dash for the water and come back to the rocks, but I saw Don Juan coming down, and I waited for him. I told him I could see in the dark. He stared at me for a long time without saying a word. 
If he did speak, perhaps I did not hear him, for I was concentrating on my new, unique ability to see in the dark. I could distinguish the very minute pebbles in the sand. At moments, everything was so clear, it seemed to be early morning or dusk. Then it would get dark. Then it would clear again. Soon I realized that the brightness corresponded to my heart's diastole and the darkness to its systole. The world changed from bright to dark to bright again with every beat of my heart. I was absorbed in this discovery when the same strange sound that I had heard before became audible again. My muscles stiffened. Anuchtal, as I heard the word this time, is here, Don Juan said. I fancied the roar so thunderous, so overwhelming that nothing else mattered. When it had subsided, I perceived a sudden increase in the volume of water. The creek, which a minute before had been less than a foot wide, expanded until it was an enormous lake. Light that seemed to come from above it touched the surface as though shining through thick foliage. From time to time the water would glitter for a second, gold and black. Then it would remain dark, lightless, almost out of sight, and yet strangely present. I don't recall how long I stayed there just watching, squatting on the shore of the black lake. The roar must have subsided in the meanwhile, because what jolted me back to reality was again a terrifying buzzing. I turned around to look for Don Juan. I saw him climbing up and disappearing behind the rock ledge. Yet the feeling of being alone did not bother me at all. I squatted there in a state of absolute confidence and abandonment. The roar again became audible. It was very intense, like the noise made by a high wind. Listening to it as carefully as I could, I was able to detect a definite melody. It was a composite of high-pitched sounds, like human voices accompanied by a deep bass drum. I focused all my attention on the melody and again noticed that the systole and diastole of my heart coincided with the sound of the bass drum and with the pattern of the music. I stood up and the melody stopped. I tried to listen to my heartbeat, but it was not detectable. I squatted again, thinking that perhaps the position of my body had caused or induced the sounds, but nothing happened, not a sound, not even my heart. I thought I had had enough. But as I stood up to leave, I felt a tremor of the earth. The ground under my feet was shaking. I was losing my balance. I fell backwards and remained on my back while the earth shook violently. I tried to grab a rock or a plant, but something was sliding under me. I jumped up, stood for a moment, and fell down again. The ground on which I sat was moving, sliding into the water like a raft. I remained motionless, stunned by a terror that was like everything else, unique, uninterrupted, and absolute. I moved through the water of the black lake, perched on a piece of soil that looked like an earthen log. I had the feeling I was going in a southerly direction, transported by the current. I could see the water moving and swirling around. It felt cold and oddly heavy to the touch. I fancied it alive. There were no distinguishable shores or landmarks, and I can't recall the thoughts or the feelings that must have come to me during this trip. After what seemed like hours of drifting, my raft made a right-angle turn to the left, the east. It continued to slide on the water for a very short distance and unexpectedly rammed against something. The impact threw me forward. I closed my eyes and felt a sharp pain as my knees and my outstretched arms hit the ground. After a moment, I looked up. I was lying on the dirt. It was as though my earthen log had merged with the land. I sat up and turned around. The water was receding. It moved backward like a wave in reverse until it disappeared. I sat there for a long time trying to collect my thoughts and resolve all that had happened into a coherent unit. My entire body ached. My throat felt like an open sore. I had bitten my lips when I landed. I stood up. The wind made me realize I was cold. My clothes were wet. My hands and jaws and knees shook so violently that I had to lie down again. Drops of perspiration slid into my eyes and burned them until I yelled with pain. After a while, I regained a measure of stability and stood up. In the dark twilight, the scene was very clear. I took a couple of steps. A distinct sound of many human voices came to me. They seemed to be talking loudly. I followed the sound. I walked for about fifty yards and came to a sudden stop. I had reached a dead end. The place where I stood was a corral formed by enormous boulders. I could distinguish another row and then another and another until they merged into the sheer mountain. 
From among them came the most exquisite music. It was a fluid, uninterrupted, eerie flow of sounds. At the foot of one boulder, I saw a man sitting on the ground, his face turned almost in profile. I approached him until I was perhaps ten feet away. Then he turned his head and looked at me. I stopped. His eyes were the water I had just seen. They had the same enormous volume, the sparkling of gold and black. His head was pointed like a strawberry. His skin was green, dotted with innumerable warts. Except for the pointed shape, his head was exactly like the surface of the peyote plant. I stood in front of him, staring. I couldn't take my eyes away from him. I felt he was deliberately pressing on my chest with the weight of his eyes. I was choking. I lost my balance and fell to the ground. His eyes turned away. I heard him talking to me. At first, his voice was like the soft rustle of a light breeze. Then I heard it as music, as a melody of voices, and I knew it was saying, What do you want? I knelt before him and talked about my life, and then wept. He looked at me again. I felt his eyes pulling me away, and I thought that moment would be the moment of my death. He signaled me to come closer. I vacillated for an instant before I took a step forward. As I came closer, he turned his eyes away from me and showed me the back of his hand. The melody said, Look. There was a round hole in the middle of his hand. Look, the melody said again. I looked into the hole, and I saw myself. I was very old and feeble, and was running, stooped over, with bright sparks flying all around me. Then three of the sparks hit me, two in the head and one in the left shoulder. My figure in the hole stood up for a moment until it was fully vertical, and then disappeared together with the hole. Mescalito turned his eyes to me again. They were so close to me that I heard them rumble softly with that peculiar sound I had heard many times that night. They became peaceful by degrees until they were like a quiet pond rippled by gold and black flashes. He turned his eyes away once more and hopped like a cricket for perhaps fifty yards. He hopped again and again and was gone. The next thing I remember is that I began to walk. Very rationally, I tried to recognize landmarks, such as mountains in the distance, in order to orient myself. I had been obsessed by cardinal points throughout the whole experience, and I believed that north had to be to my left. I walked in that direction for quite a while before I realized that it was daytime, and that I was no longer using my night vision. I remembered I had a watch, and I looked at the time. It was eight o'clock. It was about ten o'clock when I got to the ledge where I had been the night before. Don Juan was lying on the ground asleep. Where have you been? he asked. I sat down to catch my breath. After a long silence, he asked, Did you see him? I began to narrate to him the sequence of my experiences from the beginning, but he interrupted me, saying that all that mattered was whether I had seen him or not. He asked how close to me Mescalito was. I told him I had nearly touched him. We drank some water and started to walk. When we reached the edge of the valley, he seemed to hesitate for a moment before deciding which direction to take. Once he had made his choice, we walked in a straight line. Every time we came to a peyote plant, he squatted in front of it and very gently cut off the top with his short serrated knife. We collected sixty-five buttons. When the bag was completely filled, he put it on my back and strapped a new one to my chest. By the time we had crossed the plateau, we had two full sacks containing 110 peyote buttons. The bags were so heavy and bulky that I could hardly walk under their weight and volume. Don Juan whispered to me that the bags were heavy because Mescalito wanted to return to the ground. He said it was the sadness of leaving his abode which made Mescalito heavy. My real chore was not to let the bags touch the ground, because if I did, Mescalito would never allow me to take him again. At one particular moment, the pressure of the straps on my shoulders became unbearable. Something was exerting tremendous force in order to pull me down. I felt very apprehensive. I noticed that I had started to walk faster, almost at a run. I was in a way trotting behind Don Juan. Suddenly the weight on my back and chest diminished. The load became spongy and light. 
I ran freely to catch up with Don Juan, who was ahead of me. I told him I did not feel the weight any longer. He explained that we had already left Mescalito's abode. Tuesday, July 3, 1962. I think Mescalito has almost accepted you, Don Juan said. Why do you say he's almost accepted me, Don Juan? He did not kill you or even harm you. He gave you a good fright, but not a really bad one. If he had not accepted you at all, he would have appeared to you as monstrous and full of wrath. Some people have learned the meaning of horror upon encountering him and not being accepted by him. Don Juan inquired periodically, in a casual way, about the state of my datura plant. In the year that had elapsed from the time I replanted the root, the plant had grown into a large bush. It had seeded, and the seed pods had dried, and Don Juan judged it was time for me to learn more about the devil's weed. Monday, January 28, 1963. Don Juan said, If you complete the second step successfully... I can show you only one more step. In the course of learning about the devil's weed, I realized she was not for me, and I did not pursue her path any further. What made you decide against it, Don Juan? The devil's weed nearly killed me every time I tried to use her. Once it was so bad I thought I was finished, and yet I could have avoided all that pain. How? Is there a special way to avoid pain? Yes, there's a way. Is it a formula, a procedure, or what? It is a way of grabbing onto things. For instance, when I was learning about the devil's weed, I was too eager. I grabbed onto things the way kids grab onto candy. The devil's weed is only one of a million paths. Anything is one of a million paths. Un camino entre cantidades de caminos. Therefore, you must always keep in mind that a path is only a path. If you feel you should not follow it, you must not stay with it under any conditions. To have such clarity, you must lead a disciplined life. Only then will you know that any path is only a path, and there's no affront to oneself or to others in dropping it if that is what your heart tells you to do. But your decision to keep on the path or to leave it must be free of fear or ambition. I warn you, look at every path closely and deliberately. Try it as many times as you think necessary. Then ask yourself and yourself alone one question. This question is one that only a very old man asks. My benefactor told me about it once when I was young, and my blood was too vigorous for me to understand it. And now I do understand it. I will tell you what it is. Does this path have a heart? All paths are the same. They lead nowhere. They are paths going through the bush or into the bush. In my own life, I could say I have traversed long, long paths, but I am not anywhere. My benefactor's question has meaning now. Does this path have a heart? If it does, the path is good. If it doesn't, it is of no use. Both paths lead nowhere, but one has a heart, the other doesn't. One makes for a joyful journey as long as you follow it. You're one with it. The other will make you curse your life. One makes you strong. The other weakens you. Sunday, April 21st, 1963. On Tuesday afternoon, April 16th, Don Juan and I went to the hills where his datura plants are. He asked me to leave him alone there and wait for him in the car. He returned nearly three hours later carrying a package wrapped in a red cloth. As we started to drive back to his house, he pointed to the bundle and said it was his last gift for me. I asked if he meant he was not going to teach me anymore. He explained that he was referring to the fact that I had a plant fully mature and would no longer need his plants. Late in the afternoon, we sat in his room, and Don Juan began to demonstrate the preparation of the second portion of the devil's weed with the same meticulous attention and reverence that had characterized his first teaching. In a very exacting yet somehow rhythmic manner, the root, seeds, and live grain weevils were prepared. The procedure, which took many hours and was often accompanied by ritual chants, yielded a small amount of liquid and an unguent paste, 
The paste was to be applied to the temples on this occasion, and special care was to be taken to avoid the forehead. The most important and most unsettling aspect of the teaching of the second portion was the use, or more properly, the collaboration of two lizards in the sorcery. The sudden appearance of these two in the hands of Don Juan, one with eyes sewn shut, the other with her mouth similarly prepared, produced in me anxiety to the point of revulsion. The real mystery was the lizards, he said. They were to be befriended and revered as divinatory intermediaries. When the preparations were complete, Don Juan gave me a small amount of yellowish liquid to drink and led me to a rocky area near his house. He pointed to a large rock and told me to sit in front of it as if it were my datura plant. I will leave you alone, he said, and walked away. It was almost dark by then. I thought of Don Juan's words, the twilight, there's the crack between the worlds. After a long hesitation, I began to follow the steps prescribed. The paste, though it looked like oatmeal, did not feel like oatmeal. It was very smooth and cold. The paste had dried up and scaled off my temples. I was about to rub some more of it on when I realized I was sitting on my heels in Japanese fashion. I had been sitting cross-legged and did not recall changing positions. It took some time to realize fully that I was sitting on the floor in a sort of cloister with high arches. I thought they were brick arches, but upon examining them I saw they were stone. This transition was very difficult. It came so suddenly that I was not ready to follow. My perception of the elements of the vision was diffused as if I were dreaming, yet the components did not change. They remained steady, and I could stop alongside any one of them and actually examine it. The vision was not so clear or so real as one induced by peyote. It had a misty character, an intensely pleasing pastel quality. I wondered whether I could get up or not, and the next thing I noticed was that I had moved. I was at the top of a stairway, and H, a friend of mine, was standing at the bottom. Her eyes were feverish. There was a mad glare in them. She laughed aloud and with such intensity that she was terrifying. She began coming up the stairs. I wanted to run away or take cover because she'd been off her rocker once. That was the thought that came to my mind. I hid behind a column and she went by me without looking. She's going on a long trip now, was another thought that occurred to me then. And finally, the last thought I remembered was, she laughs every time she's ready to crack up. Suddenly, the scene became very clear. It was no longer like a dream. It was like an ordinary scene, but I seemed to be looking at it through window glass. I tried to touch a column, but all I sensed was that I couldn't move. Yet I knew I could stay as long as I wanted, viewing the scene. I was in it, and yet I was not part of it. I experienced a barrage of rational thoughts and arguments. I was, so far as I could judge, in an ordinary state of sober consciousness. Every element belonged in the realm of my normal processes, and yet I knew it was not an ordinary state. The scene changed abruptly. It was night time. I was in the hall of a building. The darkness inside the building made me aware that in the earlier scene the sunlight had been beautifully clear, yet it had been so commonplace that I did not notice it at the time. As I looked further into the new vision, I saw a young man coming out of a room carrying a large knapsack on his shoulders. I didn't know who he was, although I had seen him once or twice. He walked by me and went down the stairs. By then I had forgotten my apprehension, my rational dilemmas. Who's that guy, I thought? Why did I see him? The scene changed again, and I was watching the young man deface books. He glued some of the pages together, erased markings, and so on. Then I saw him arranging the books neatly in a wooden crate. There was a pile of crates. They were not in his room, but in a storage place. Other images came to my mind, but they were not clear. The scene became foggy. I had a sensation of spinning. Don Juan shook me by the shoulders, and I woke up. He helped me to stand, and we walked back to his house. The next step in Don Juan's teachings was a new aspect of mastering the second portion of the Datura route. In the time that elapsed between the two stages of learning, Don Juan inquired only about the development of my plant. Saturday, June 29, 1963. I brought up the subject of the devil's weed. I wanted Don Juan to tell me more about it, and yet I did not want to be committed to participate. The second portion is used only to divine, isn't that so, Don Juan? I asked to start the conversation. Not only to divine. 
One learns the sorcery of the lizards with the aid of the second portion, and at the same time one tests the devil's weed. But in reality, the second portion is used for other purposes. The sorcery of the lizards is only the beginning. Then what is it used for, Don Juan? He did not answer. He abruptly changed the subject and asked me how big were the datura plants growing around my own plant. I made a gesture of size. Don Juan said, I've taught you how to tell a male from a female. Now go to your plants and bring me both. Saturday, July 6th, 1963. On Monday, July 1st, I cut the datura plants Don Juan had asked for. I took the plants to Don Juan's house on Tuesday, July 2nd. He opened the bundles and examined the pieces. He said it would take two days to prepare this second portion. He told me not to eat anything in the meantime. I could have water, but no food at all. The next day, Thursday, July 4th, Don Juan directed me to leach the root four times. By the last time I poured the water out of the bowl, it had already become dark. We sat on the porch. He put both bowls in front of him. The root extract measured a teaspoon of a whitish starch. He put it into a cup and added water. He rotated the cup in his hand to dissolve the substance and then handed the cup to me. He told me to drink all that was in the cup. I drank it fast and then put the cup on the floor and slumped back. My heart began pounding. I felt I could not breathe. Don Juan ordered me matter-of-factly to take off all my clothes. I asked him why, and he said I had to rub myself with the paste. I hesitated. I did not know whether to undress. Don Juan urged me to hurry up. He said there was very little time to fool around. I followed his directions. The paste was cold and had a particularly strong odor. When I had finished applying it, I straightened up. The smell from the mixture entered my nostrils. It was suffocating me. The pungent odor was actually choking me. It was like a gas of some sort. I tried to breathe through my mouth and tried to talk to Don Juan, but I couldn't. Don Juan kept staring at me. I took a step toward him. My legs were rubbery and long, extremely long. I took another step. My knee joints felt springy like a vault pole. They shook and vibrated and contracted elastically. I moved forward. The motion of my body was slow and shaky. It was more like a tremor forward and up. I looked down and saw Don Juan sitting below me, way below me. The momentum carried me forward one more step, which was even more elastic and longer than the preceding one. And from there, I soared. I remember coming down once, then I pushed up with both feet, sprang backwards and glided on my back. I saw the dark sky above me and the clouds going by me. I jerked my body so I could look down. I saw the dark mass of the mountains. My speed was extraordinary. My arms were fixed, folded against my sides. My head was the directional unit. If I kept it bent backwards, I made vertical circles. I changed directions by turning my head to the side. I enjoyed such freedom and swiftness as I had never known before. The marvelous darkness gave me a feeling of sadness, of longing, perhaps. It was as if I had found a place where I belonged, the darkness of the night. I tried to look around, but all I sensed was that the night was serene, and yet it held so much power. Suddenly I knew it was time to come down. It was as if I had been given an order I had to obey, and I began descending like a feather with lateral motions. That type of movement made me very ill. It was slow and jerky, as though I were being lowered by pulleys. I got sick. My head was bursting with the most excruciating pain. A kind of blackness enveloped me. I was very aware of the feeling of being suspended in it. The next thing I remember is the feeling of waking up. I was in my bed in my own room. I sat up, and the image of my room dissolved. I stood up. I was naked. The motion of standing made me sick again. I recognized some of the landmarks. I was about half a mile from Don Juan's house, near the place of his datura plants. Suddenly everything fitted into place, and I realized that I would have to walk all the way back to his house naked. To be deprived of clothes was a profound psychological disadvantage, but there was nothing I could do to solve the problem. I thought of making myself a skirt with branches, but the thought seemed ludicrous, and besides, it was soon going to be dawn, for the morning twilight was already clear. I forgot about my discomfort and my nausea and started to walk toward the house. I was obsessed with the fear of being discovered. I watched for people and dogs. I tried to run, but I hurt my feet on the small, sharp stones. I walked slowly. It was already very clear. Then I saw somebody coming up the road, and I quickly jumped behind the bushes. 
My situation seemed so incongruous to me. A moment before I had been enjoying the unbelievable pleasure of flying, the next minute I found myself hiding, embarrassed by my own nakedness. I thought of jumping out on the road again and running with all my might past the person who was coming. I thought he would be so startled that by the time he realized it was a naked man, I would have left him far behind. I thought all that, but I did not dare to move. The person coming up the road was just upon me and stopped walking. I heard him calling my name. It was Don Juan, and he had my clothes. As I put them on, he looked at me and he laughed. He laughed so hard that I wound up laughing too. The same day, Friday, July 5th, late in the afternoon, Don Juan asked me to narrate the details of my experience. As carefully as I could, I related the whole episode. The second portion of the devil's weed is used to fly, he said when I had finished. The unguent by itself is not enough. My benefactor said that it is the root that gives direction and wisdom, and it is the cause of flying. As you learn more and take it often in order to fly, you will begin to see everything with great clarity. There was a question I wanted to ask him. I knew he was going to evade it, so I waited for him to mention the subject. I waited all day. Finally, before I left that evening, I had to ask him, Did I really fly, Don Juan? That is what you told me, didn't you? I know, Don Juan. I mean, did my body fly? Did I take off like a bird? You always ask me questions I cannot answer. You flew. That is what the second portion of the devil's weed is for. As you take more of it, you will learn how to fly perfectly. It's not a simple matter. A man flies with the help of the second portion of the devil's weed. That is all I can tell you. What you want to know makes no sense. Birds fly like birds, and a man who has taken the devil's weed flies as such. El enyerbado vuela así. As birds do? Así como los pájaros? No. He flies as a man who has taken the weed. No. Así como los enyerbados. Let's put it another way, Don Juan. What I meant to say is that if I had tied myself to a rock with a heavy chain, I would have flown just the same because my body had nothing to do with my flying? Don Juan looked at me incredulously. If you tie yourself to a rock, he said, I'm afraid you will have to fly holding the rock with its heavy chain. Collecting the ingredients and preparing them for the smoke mixture formed a yearly cycle. The first year, Don Juan taught me the procedure. In December of 1962, the second year, when the cycle was renewed, Don Juan merely directed me. I collected the ingredients myself, prepared them, and put them away until the next year. In December 1963, a new cycle started for the third time. As soon as we had finished the third collecting and preparing cycle, Don Juan began to talk about the smoke as an ally for the first time in more than a year. Tuesday, December 31st, 1963. On Thursday, December 26th, I had my first experience with Don Juan's ally, the smoke. Without giving me an opportunity to say anything, Don Juan told me he was going to light his pipe for me right then. I tried to dissuade him, arguing that I did not believe I was ready. I told him I felt I had not handled the pipe for a long enough time but he said there was not much time left for me to learn and I had to use the pipe very soon. He brought the pipe out of its sack and fondled it. I sat on the floor next to him and frantically tried to get sick and pass out, to do anything, to put off this unavoidable step. He held the pipe in his left hand and with an extremely swift movement of his right hand picked up a burning piece of charcoal and put it into the bowl of the pipe. Then he sat up straight, and holding the pipe with both hands, put it to his mouth and puffed three times. He stretched his arms to me and told me in a forceful whisper to take the pipe with both hands and smoke. The thought of refusing the pipe and running away crossed my mind for an instant, but Don Juan demanded again, still in a whisper, that I take the pipe and smoke. I looked at him. His eyes were fixed on me, but his stare was friendly, concerned, it was clear that I had made the choice a long time before. There was no alternative but to do what he said. Don Juan told me to inhale. 
The smoke flowed into my mouth and seemed to circulate there. It was heavy. I felt as though I had a mouthful of dough. The simile occurred to me, although I had never had a mouthful of dough. The smoke was also like menthol, and the inside of my mouth suddenly became cold. It was a refreshing sensation. Again. Again. Suddenly Don Juan leaned over and took the pipe from my hands. He tapped the ashes gently on the dish with the charcoals. Then he wet his finger with saliva and rotated it inside the bowl to clean its sides. He blew through the stem repeatedly. I saw him put the pipe back into its sheath. His actions held my interest. Don Juan sat next to me, to my right, and without moving held the pipe sheath against the floor as though keeping it down by force. My hands were heavy. My arms sagged, pulling my shoulders down. My nose was running. I wiped it with the back of my hand, and my upper lip was rubbed off. I wiped my face, and all the flesh was wiped off. I was melting. I felt as if my flesh was actually melting. I jumped to my feet and tried to grab hold of something, anything with which to support myself. I was experiencing a terror I had never felt before. I held onto a pole that Don Juan keeps stuck on the floor in the center of his room. I stood there for a moment, then I turned to look at him. He was still, sitting motionless, holding his pipe, staring at me. My breath was painfully hot or cold. It was choking me. I bent my head forward to rest it on the pole, but apparently I missed it, and my head kept on moving downward beyond the point where the pole was. I stopped when I was nearly down to the floor. I pulled myself up. The pole was there in front of my eyes. I tried again to rest my head on it. I tried to control myself and to be aware and kept my eyes open as I leaned forward to touch the pole with my forehead. It was a few inches from my eyes, but as I put my head against it, I had the queerest feeling that I was going right through it. In a desperate search for a rational explanation, I concluded that my eyes were distorting depth and that the pole must have been ten feet away even though I saw it directly in front of my face. I then conceived a logical, rational way to check the position of the pole. I began moving sideways around it, one little step at a time. My argument was that in walking around the pole in that way, I couldn't possibly make a circle more than five feet in diameter. If the pole was really ten feet away from me or beyond my reach, a moment would come when I would have my back to it. I trusted that at that moment the pole would vanish, because in reality it would be behind me. I then proceeded to circle the pole, but it remained in front of my eyes as I went around it. In a fit of frustration I grabbed it with both hands, but my hands went through it. I was grabbing the air. I carefully calculated the distance between the pole and myself. I figured it must be three feet. That is, my eyes perceived it as three feet. I played for a moment with the perception of depth by moving my head from one side to the other, focusing each eye in turn on the pole and then on the background. According to my way of judging depth, the pole was unmistakably before me, possibly three feet away. Stretching out my arms to protect my head, I charged with all my strength. The sensation was the same. I went through the pole. This time I went all the way to the floor. I stood up again and standing up was perhaps the most unusual of all the acts I performed that night. I thought myself up. In order to get up, I did not use my muscles and skeletal frame in the way I'm accustomed to doing, because I no longer had control over them. I knew it the instant I hit the ground. But my curiosity about the pole was so strong, I thought myself up in a kind of reflex action, and before I fully realized I could not move, I was up. I called to Don Juan for help. At one moment I yelled frantically at the top of my voice, but Don Juan did not move. He kept on looking at me sideways, as though he didn't want to turn his head to face me fully. I took a step toward him, but instead of moving forward I staggered backward and fell against the wall. I knew I had rammed against it with my back, yet it did not feel hard. I was completely suspended in a soft, spongy substance. It was the wall. My arms were stretched out laterally, and slowly my whole body seemed to sink into the wall. I could only look forward into the room. Don Juan was still watching me, but he made no move to help me. I made a supreme effort to jerk my body out of the wall, but it only sank deeper and deeper. In the midst of indescribable terror, I felt that the spongy wall was closing in on my face. I tried to shut my eyes, but they were fixed open. I don't remember what else happened. Suddenly, Don Juan was in front of me a short distance away. 
We were in the other room. I saw his table and the dirt stove with the fire burning, and with the corner of my eye I distinguished the fence outside the house. I could see everything very clearly. Don Juan had brought the kerosene lantern and hung it from the beam in the middle of the room. I tried to look in a different direction, but my eyes were set to see only straight forward. I couldn't distinguish or feel any part of my body. My breathing was undetectable, but my thoughts were extremely lucid. I was clearly aware of whatever was taking place in front of me. Don Juan walked toward me and my clarity of mind ended. Something seemed to stop inside me. There were no more thoughts. I saw Don Juan coming and I hated him. I wanted to tear him apart. I could have killed him then, but I could not move. At first I vaguely sensed a pressure on my head, but it also disappeared. There was only one thing left, an overwhelming anger at Don Juan. I saw him only a few inches from me. I wanted to claw him apart. I felt I was groaning. Something in me began to convulse. I heard Don Juan talking to me. His voice was soft and soothing, and I felt infinitely pleasing. He came even closer and started to recite a Spanish lullaby. A warmth pervaded me. It was a warmth of heart and feelings. Don Juan's words were a distant echo. They recalled the forgotten memories of childhood. The resentment changed into a longing a joyous affection for Don Juan. He said I must struggle not to fall asleep, that I no longer had a body and was free to turn into anything I wanted. Either I moved forward or he came closer to me. His hands were almost on my face, on my eyes, although I did not feel them. Get inside my chest, I heard him say. I felt I was engulfing him. It was the same sensation of the sponginess of the wall. Then I could hear only his voice commanding me to look and see. I could not distinguish him any more. My eyes were apparently open, for I saw flashes of light on a red field. It was as though I was looking at a light through my closed eyelids. Then my thoughts were turned on again. They came back in a fast barrage of images, faces, scenery. Scenes without any coherence popped up and disappeared. It was like a fast dream in which images overlap and change. Then the thoughts began to diminish in number and intensity, and soon they were gone again. There was only an awareness of affection, of being happy. I couldn't distinguish any shapes or light. All of a sudden I was pulled up. I distinctly felt I was being lifted, and I was free, moving with tremendous lightness and speed in water or air. I swam like an eel. I contorted and twisted and soared up and down at will. I felt a cold wind blowing all around me, and I began to float like a feather, back and forth, down and down and down. Saturday, December 28, 1963. I woke up yesterday late in the afternoon. Don Juan told me I had slept peacefully for nearly two days. I had a splitting headache. I drank some water and got sick. I felt tired, extremely tired, and after eating, I went back to sleep. Today I felt perfectly relaxed again. Don Juan and I talked about my experience with the little smoke. Thinking that he wanted me to tell the whole story the way I always did, I began to describe my impressions, but he stopped me and said it was not necessary. He told me I had not really done anything, and that I had fallen asleep right away, so there was nothing to talk about. Well, how about the way I felt? Isn't that important at all, I insisted? No, not with the smoke. Later on, when you learn how to travel, we'll talk. When you learn how to get into things. Does one really get into things? Don't you remember? You went into and through that wall. Now, I think I really went out of my mind. No, you didn't. I really felt I had lost my body, Don Juan. You did. But you saw me as I am now, didn't you? No. You were not as you are now. now. True, I admit that, but I had my body, didn't I, although I couldn't feel it. No, God damn it! you did not have a body like the body you have today. Well, what happened to my body then? I thought you understood. The little smoke took your body. But where did it go? Well, how in the hell do you expect me to know that? It was useless to persist in trying to get a rational explanation. I told him I did not want to argue or to ask stupid questions, but if I accepted the idea that it was possible to lose my body, I would lose all my rationality. He said that I was exaggerating, as usual, and that I did not, nor was I going to, lose anything because of the little smoke. 
Tuesday, January 28, 1964. I asked Don Juan again to tell me about my appearance. I wanted to know how I looked, for the image of a bodiless being he had planted in my mind was understandably unbearable. He said that to tell the truth he was afraid to look at me. He felt the same way his benefactor must have felt when he saw Don Juan smoking for the first time. Or why were you afraid? Was I that frightening, I asked? I had never seen anyone smoking before. Didn't you see your benefactor smoke? No. You've never seen even yourself? How could I? You could smoke in front of a mirror. He did not answer, but stared at me and shook his head. What would happen if I smoked in front of a camera and took a picture of myself? I don't know. The smoke would probably turn against you. But I suppose you find it so harmless you feel you can play with it. My last encounter with Mescalito was a cluster of four sessions which took place within four consecutive days. Don Juan called this long session a mitote. It was a peyote ceremony for peyoteros and apprentices. There were two older men about Don Juan's age, one of whom was the leader, and five younger men, including myself. The ceremony took place in the state of Chihuahua, Mexico, near the Texas border. It consisted of singing and of ingesting peyote during the night. In the daytime, women attendants who stayed outside the confines of the ceremony site supplied each man with water, and only a token of ritual food was consumed each day. Saturday, September 12, 1964. During the first night of the ceremony, Thursday, September 3rd, I took eight peyote buttons. They had no effect on me, or if they did, it was a very slight one. I kept my eyes closed most of the night. I felt much better that way. I did not fall asleep, nor was I tired. At the very end of the session, the singing became extraordinary. For a brief moment, I felt uplifted and wanted to weep, but as the song ended, the feeling vanished. At sundown on Friday, September 4th, the second session began. The leader sang his peyote song, and the cycle of songs and intake of peyote buttons began once again. It ended in the morning with each man singing his own song, in unison with the others. It must have been toward the end of the session that the singing was greatly accelerated, with everybody singing at once. I perceived that something or somebody outside the house wanted to come in. I couldn't tell whether the singing was done to prevent it from bursting in or to lure it inside. I was the only one who did not have a song. They all seemed to look at me questioningly, especially the young men. I grew embarrassed and closed my eyes. Suddenly everything vanished or crumbled, and there emerged in its place the man-like figure of Mescalito I had seen two years before. He was sitting some distance away with his profile toward me. I stared fixedly at him, but he did not look at me. Not once did he turn. I believed I was doing something wrong, something that kept him away. I got up and walked toward him to ask about it, but the act of moving dispelled the image. It began to fade, and the figures of the men I was with were superimposed upon it. Again I heard the loud, frantic singing. I went into the nearby bushes and walked for a while. Everything stood out very clearly. I noticed I was seeing in the darkness, but it mattered very little this time. The important point was, why did Mescalito avoid me? I returned to join the group, and as I was about to enter the house, I heard a heavy rumbling and felt a tremor. The ground shook. It was the same noise I had heard in the Peyote Valley two years before. I ran into the bushes again. I knew that Mescalito was there and that I was going to find him, but he was not there. I waited until morning and joined the others just before the session ended. The usual procedure was repeated on the third day. I was not tired, but I slept during the afternoon. In the evening of Saturday, September 5th, the old man sang his peyote song to start the cycle once more. During this session, I chewed only one button and did not listen to any of the songs, nor did I pay attention to anything that went on. From the first moment, my whole being was uniquely concentrated on one point. I knew something terribly important for my well-being was missing. While the men sang, I asked Mascalito in a loud voice to teach me a song. My pleading mingled with the men's loud singing. Immediately I heard a song in my ears. I turned around and sat with my back to the group and listened. I heard the words and the tune over and over, and I repeated them until I had learned the whole song. It was a long song in Spanish. Then I sang it to the group several times, and soon afterwards a new song came to my ears. 
By morning I had sung both songs countless times. I felt I had been renewed, fortified. After the water was given to us, Don Juan gave me a bag, and we all went into the hills. It was a long, strenuous walk to a low mesa. There I saw several peyote plants, but for some reason I did not want to look at them. After we had crossed the mesa, the group broke up. Don Juan and I walked back, collecting peyote buttons, just as we had done the first time I helped him. We returned in the late afternoon of Sunday, September 6th. In the evening, the leader opened the cycle again. Nobody had said a word, but I knew perfectly well it was the last gathering. This time, the old man sang a new song. A sack with fresh peyote buttons was passed around. This was the first time I had tasted a fresh button. It was pulpy, but hard to chew. It resembled a hard green fruit and was sharper and more bitter than the dried buttons. Personally, I found the fresh peyote infinitely more alive. I chewed fourteen buttons. I counted them carefully. I did not finish the last one, for I heard the familiar rumble that marked the presence of Mescalito. Everybody sang frantically, and I knew that Don Juan and everybody else had actually heard the noise. I refused to think that their reaction was a response to a cue given by one of them merely to deceive me. At that moment, I felt a great surge of wisdom engulfing me. A conjecture I had played with for three years turned then into a certainty. It had taken me three years to realize, or rather to find out, that whatever is contained in the cactus Lophophora Williamsi had nothing to do with me in order to exist as an entity. It existed by itself, out there at large. I knew it then. I sang feverishly until I could no longer voice the words. I felt as if my songs were inside my body, shaking me uncontrollably. I needed to go out and find Mescalito or I would explode. I walked toward the peyote field. I kept on singing my songs. I knew they were individually mine, the unquestionable proof of my singleness. I sensed each one of my steps. They resounded on the ground. Their echo produced the indescribable euphoria of being a man. Each one of the peyote plants on the field shone with a bluish, scintillating light. One plant had a very bright light. I sat in front of it and sang my songs to it. As I sang, Mescalito came out of the plant, the same man-like figure I had seen before. He looked at me. With great audacity for a person of my temperament, I sang to him. There was a sound of flutes or of wind, a familiar musical vibration. He seemed to have said, as he said two years before, What do you want? I spoke very loudly. I said that I knew there was something amiss in my life and in my actions, but I could not find out what it was. I begged him to tell me what was wrong with me, and also to tell me his name so that I could call him when I needed him. He looked at me, elongated his mouth like a trumpet until it reached my ear, and then told me his name. Suddenly I saw my own father standing in the middle of the peyote field. But the field had vanished, and the scene was my old home, the home of my childhood. My father and I were standing by a fig tree. I embraced my father and hurriedly began to tell him things I had never before been able to say. Every one of my thoughts was concise and to the point. It was as if we had no time, really, and I had to say everything at once. I said staggering things about my feelings toward him, things I would never have been able to voice under ordinary circumstances. My father did not speak. He just listened, and then was pulled or sucked away. I was alone again. I wept with remorse and sadness. I walked through the peyote field calling the name Mescalito had taught me. Something emerged from a strange star-like light on a peyote plant. It was a long, shiny object, a stick of light the size of a man. For a moment it illuminated the whole field with an intense yellowish or amber light. Then it lit up the whole sky above, creating a portentous, marvelous sight. I thought I would go blind if I kept on looking. I covered my eyes and I buried my head in my arms. I had a clear notion that Mescalito told me to eat one more peyote button. I thought, I can't do that because I have no knife to cut it. Eat one from the ground, he said to me in the same strange way. I lay on my stomach and chewed the top of a plant. It kindled me. It filled every corner of my body with warmth and directness. Everything was alive. 
Everything had exquisite and intricate detail, and yet everything was so simple. I was everywhere. I could see up and down and around, all at the same time. This particular feeling lasted long enough for me to become aware of it. Then it changed into an oppressive terror, terror that did not come upon me abruptly, but somehow swiftly. At first, my marvelous world of silence was jolted by sharp noises, but I was not concerned. Then the noises became louder and were uninterrupted, as if they were closing in on me. And gradually I lost the feeling of floating in a world undifferentiated, indifferent, and beautiful. The noises became gigantic steps. Something enormous was breathing and moving around me. I believed it was hunting for me. I ran and hid under a boulder and tried to determine from there what was following me. Slowly I began to regain my usual sensorial processes. I lay on my stomach with my chin on my folded arm. The peyote plant in front of me began to light up again, and before I could move my eyes, the long light emerged again. It hovered over me. I sat up. The light touched my whole body with quiet strength and then rolled away out of sight. I ran all the way to the place where the other men were. We all returned to town. Don Juan and I stayed one more day with Don Roberto, the peyote leader. I slept all the time we were there. When we were about to leave, the young men who had taken part in the peyote sessions came up to me. They embraced me one by one and laughed shyly. Each one of them introduced himself. I talked with them for hours about everything except the peyote meetings. Don Juan said it was time to leave. The young men embraced me again. Come back, one of them said. We are already waiting for you, another one added. I drove away slowly, trying to see the older men, but none of them was there. Thursday, September 10th, 1964. To tell Don Juan about an experience always forced me to recall it step by step to the best of my ability. This seemed to be the only way to remember everything. Today I told him the details of my last encounter with Mescalito. He listened to my story attentively up to the point when Mescalito told me his name. Don Juan interrupted me there. You're on your own now, he said. The protector has accepted you. I'll be of very little help to you from now on. You don't have to tell me anything more about your relationship with him. You know his name now, and neither his name nor his dealings with you should ever be mentioned to a living being. I insisted that I wanted to tell him all the details of the experience because it made no sense to me. I told him I needed his assistance to interpret what I had seen. He said I could do that by myself, that it was better for me to start thinking on my own. Friday, September 11th, 1964. Again I insisted upon having Don Juan interpret my visionary experiences. He stalled for a while. Then he spoke as if we had already been carrying on a conversation about Mescalito. You asked him to tell you what's wrong with you, and he gave you the full picture. There can be no mistake. You can't claim you did not understand. He said, You think there are two worlds for you, two paths, but there's only one. The protector showed you this with unbelievable clarity. The only world available to you is the world of men, and that world you cannot choose to leave. You are a man. The protector showed you the world of happiness, where there's no difference between things because there is no one there to ask about the difference. But that is not the world of men. The protector shook you out of it and showed you how a man thinks and fights. That is the world of man. And to be a man is to be condemned to that world. You have the vanity to believe you live in two worlds, but that is only your vanity. There is but one single world for us. We are men and must follow the world of men contentedly. I believe that was the lesson. Don Juan seemed to want me to work with the devil's weed as much as possible. This stand was incongruous with his alleged dislike of the power. He explained himself by saying that the time when I had the smoke again was near, and by then I ought to have developed a better knowledge of the power of the devil's weed. He suggested repeatedly that I should at least test the devil's weed with one more sorcery with the lizards. I played with the idea for a long time. Don Juan's urgency increased dramatically until I felt obliged to heed his demand, and one day I made up my mind to divine about some stolen objects. Monday, December 28, 1964. I followed all the instructions meticulously. I drank the potion and waited a while. 
I felt nothing out of the ordinary. I began rubbing the paste on my temples. I applied it twenty-five times. Then, quite mechanically, as if I were absent-minded, I spread it repeatedly all over my forehead. I realized my mistake and hurriedly wiped the paste off. My forehead was sweaty. I became feverish. Intense anxiety gripped me, for Don Juan had strongly advised me not to rub the paste on my forehead. The fear changed into a feeling of absolute loneliness, a feeling of being doomed. I was there by myself. If something harmful was going to happen to me, there was no one there to help me. I wanted to run away. I had an alarming sensation of indecision, of not knowing what to do. A flood of thoughts rushed into my mind, flashing with extraordinary speed. I noticed that they were rather strange thoughts. That is, they were strange in the sense that they seemed to come in a different way from ordinary thoughts. I am familiar with the way I think. My thoughts have a definite order that is my own, and any deviation is noticeable. One of the alien thoughts was about a statement made by an author. It was, I vaguely remember, more like a voice or something said somewhere in the background. It happened so fast that it startled me. I paused to consider it, but it changed into an ordinary thought. I was certain I had read the statement, but I could not think of the author's name. I suddenly remembered that it was Alfred Kroeber. Then another alien thought popped up and said that it was not Kroeber, but Georg Simmel who had made the statement. I insisted that it was Kroeber, and the next thing I knew I was in the midst of an argument with myself and had forgotten about my feeling of being doomed. My eyelids were heavy, as though I had taken sleeping pills. Then quite suddenly I woke up, or rather I clearly felt that I had. My first thought was about the time of day. I looked around. I was not in front of the Datura plant. Nonchalantly I accepted the fact that I was undergoing another divinatory experience. It was 12.35 by a clock above my head. I knew it was afternoon. I saw a young man carrying a stack of papers. I was nearly touching him. I saw the veins of his neck pulsating and heard the fast beating of his heart. I had become absorbed in what I was seeing and had not been aware so far of the quality of my thoughts. Then I heard a voice in my ear describing the scene, and I realized that the voice was the alien thought in my mind. I became so engrossed in listening that the scene lost its visual interest for me. I heard the voice at my right ear above my shoulder. It actually created the scene by describing it but it obeyed my will, because I could stop at any time and examine the details of what it said at my leisure. I heard, saw the entire sequence of the young man's actions. The voice went on explaining them in minute detail, but somehow the action was not important. The little voice was the extraordinary issue. Three times during the course of the experience I tried to turn around to see who was talking. I tried to turn my head all the way to the right or just whirl around unexpectedly to see if somebody was there, but every time I did it, my vision became blurry. I thought, the reason I cannot turn around is because the scene is not in the realm of ordinary reality, and that thought was my own. From then on, I concentrated my attention on the voice alone. It seemed to come from my shoulder. It was perfectly clear, although it was a small voice. It was, however, not a child's voice or a falsetto voice, but a miniature man's voice. It wasn't my voice either. I presumed it was English that I heard. Whenever I tried deliberately to trap the voice, it subsided altogether or became vague and the scene faded. I thought of a simile. The voice was like the image created by dust particles in the eyelashes or the blood vessels in the cornea of the eye, a worm-like shape that can be seen as long as one is not looking at it directly. But the moment one tries to look at it, it shifts out of sight with the movement of the eyeball. I became totally disinterested in the action. As I listened, the voice became more complex. What I thought to be a voice was more like something whispering thoughts into my ear, but that was not accurate. Something was thinking for me. The thoughts were outside myself. I knew that was so because I could hold my own thoughts and the thoughts of the other at the same time. At one point, the voice created scenes acted out by the young man, which had nothing to do with my original question about the lost objects. The young man performed very complex acts. The action had become important again, and I paid no more attention to the voice. I began to lose patience. I wanted to stop. How can I end this, I thought. The voice in my ear said I should go back to the canyon. I asked how, and the voice answered that I should think of my plant. I thought of my plant. Usually I sat in front of it. I had done it so many times that it was quite easy for me to visualize it. 
I believed that seeing it as I did at that moment was another hallucination, but the voice said I was back. I strained to listen. There was only silence. The Datura plant in front of me seemed as real as everything else I had seen, but I could touch it. I could move around. Thursday, December 24th, 1964. Today I narrated the whole experience to Don Juan. As usual, he listened without interrupting me. At the end, we had the following dialogue. You did something very wrong. I know it. It was a very stupid error, an accident. There are no accidents when you deal with the devil's weed. I told you she would test you all the way. As I see it, either you are very strong or the weed really likes you. The center of the forehead is only for the great brujos who know how to handle her power. That is why your act is truly astonishing to me. You had no steps to follow, and we must follow certain steps, because it is in the steps where man finds strength. Without them we are nothing. We remained silent for hours. He seemed to be immersed in very deep deliberation. Saturday, December 26th, 1964. Don Juan asked me if I had looked for the lizards. I told him I had, but that I couldn't find them. I asked him what would have happened if one of the lizards had died while I was holding it. He said the death of a lizard would be an unfortunate event. If the lizard with the sewed-up mouth had died at any time, there would have been no sense in pursuing the sorcery, he said. It would also have meant that the lizards had withdrawn their friendship, and I would have had to give up learning about the devil's weed for a long time. How long, Don Juan, I asked. Two years or more? What would have happened if the other lizard had died? If the second lizard had died, you would have been in real danger. You would have been alone without a guide. If she died before you started the sorcery, you could have stopped it. But if you had stopped it, you would also have to give up the devil's weed for good. If the lizard had died while she was on your shoulder, after you had begun the sorcery, you would have had to go ahead with it, and that would truly have been madness. Why would it have been madness? Because under such conditions nothing makes sense. You are alone without a guide, seeing terrifying, nonsensical things. What do you mean by nonsensical things? Things we see by ourselves. Things we see when we have no direction. It means the devil's weed is trying to get rid of you, finally pushing you away. Do you know anyone who ever experienced that? Yes, I did. Without the wisdom of the lizards, I went mad. What, what did you see, Don Juan? A bunch of nonsense. What else could I have seen without direction? Monday, December 28, 1964. You told me, Don Juan, that the devil's weed tests men. What did you mean by that? The devil's weed is like a woman. And like a woman, she flatters men. She sets traps for them at every turn. She did it to you when she forced you to rub the paste on your forehead. She'll try it again, and you'll probably fall for it. I warn you against it. Don't take her with passion. The devil's weed is only one path to the secrets of a man of knowledge. There are other paths. But her trap is to make you believe that hers is the only way. I say it is useless to waste your life on one path, especially if that path has no heart. But how do you know when a path has no heart, Don Juan? Before you embark on it, you ask the question, Does this path have a heart? If the answer is no, you will know it, and then you must choose another path. But how will I know for sure whether a path has a heart or not? Anybody would know that. The trouble is nobody asks the question. And when a man finally realizes that he has taken a path without a heart, the path is ready to kill him. At that point, very few men can stop to deliberate and leave the path. How should I proceed to ask the question properly, Don Juan? Just ask it. I mean, is there a proper method so I would not lie to myself and believe the answer is yes when it's really no? Why would you lie? Well, perhaps because at the moment the path is pleasant and enjoyable. That is nonsense. A path without a heart is never enjoyable. You have to work hard even to take it. On the other hand, a path with heart is easy. It does not make you work at liking it. Don Juan suddenly changed the direction of the conversation and bluntly confronted me with the idea that I liked the devil's weed. I had to admit that I had at least a preference for it. 
He asked me how I felt about his ally, the smoke, and I had to tell him that just the idea of it frightened me out of my senses. I've told you that to choose a path you must be free from fear and ambition, but the smoke blinds you with fear and the devil's weed blinds you with ambition. I argued that one needs ambition even to embark on any path, and that his statement that one had to be free from ambition did not make sense. A person has to have ambition in order to learn. The desire to learn is not ambition, he said. It is our lot as men to want to know. But to seek the devil's weed is to bid for power, and that is ambition, because you are not bidding to know. Don't let the devil's weed blind you. She's hooked you already. She entices men and gives them a sense of power. She makes them feel they can do things that no ordinary man can. But that is her trap. And the next thing, the path without a heart, will turn against men and destroy them. It does not take much to die. And to seek death is to seek nothing. In the month of December 1964, Don Juan and I went to collect the different plants needed to make the smoking mixture. It was the fourth cycle. Don Juan merely supervised my actions. He urged me to take time, to watch and to deliberate before I picked any of the plants. As soon as the ingredients had been gathered and stored, he prompted me to meet with his ally again. Wednesday, January 27, 1965. On Tuesday, January 19th, I smoked again the hallucinogenic mixture. I had told Don Juan I felt very apprehensive about the smoke and that it frightened me. He said I had to try it again to evaluate it with justice. We walked into his room. It was almost two o'clock in the afternoon. He brought out the pipe. I got the charcoals, then we sat facing each other. He said he was going to warm up the pipe and awaken her, and if I watched carefully I would see how she glowed. He put the pipe to his lips three or four times and sucked through it. He rubbed it tenderly. Suddenly he nodded, almost imperceptibly, to signal me to look at the pipe's awakening. I looked, but I couldn't see it. He handed the pipe to me. I filled the bowl with my own mixture and then picked a burning charcoal with a pair of tweezers I had made from a wooden clothespin and had been saving for this occasion. Don Juan looked at my tweezers and began to laugh. I vacillated for a moment, and the charcoal stuck to the tweezers. I was afraid to tap them against the pipe bowl, and I had to spit on the charcoal to put it out. Don Juan turned his head away and covered his face with his arm. His body shook. For a moment I thought he was crying, but he was laughing silently. The action was interrupted for a long time. Then he swiftly picked up a charcoal himself, put it in the bowl, and ordered me to smoke. I counted twenty inhalations, and then the count did not matter any longer. I began to sweat. Don Juan looked at me fixedly and told me not to be afraid and to do exactly as he said. I tried to say all right, but instead I made a weird howling sound. It went on resounding after I had closed my mouth. The sound startled Don Juan, who had another attack of laughter. I wanted to say yes with my head, but I couldn't move. Don Juan opened my hands gently and took the pipe away. He ordered me to lie down on the floor, but not to fall asleep. I did not experience fear or unpleasantness during the state itself, nor was I sick upon awakening the next day. The only thing out of the ordinary was that I could not think clearly for some time after waking up. Then gradually, in a period of four or five hours, I became myself again. Wednesday, January 20th, 1965. Don Juan did not talk about my experience, nor did he ask me to relate it to him. His sole comment was that I had fallen asleep too soon. The only way to stay awake is to become a bird or a cricket or something of the sort, he said. Sunday, February 7th, 1965. My second attempt in this, the fourth year of the cycle with the smoke, took place about midday on Sunday, January 31st. I woke up the following day in the early evening. I had the sensation of possessing an unusual power to recollect whatever Don Juan had said to me during the experience. I tried to narrate my experience to Don Juan. He said I had done nothing important. I mentioned that I could remember everything that had happened, but he did not want to hear about it. He had said that my body was disappearing and only my head was going to remain, and in such a condition the only way to stay awake and move around was by becoming a crow. He had commanded me to make an effort to wink, adding that whenever I was capable of winking I would be ready to proceed. 
He said that my mouth and nose were going to grow between my eyes until I had a strong beak. He said that crows see straight to the side and commanded me to turn my head and look at him with one eye. He said that if I wanted to change and look with the other eye, I had to shake my beak down, and that that movement would make me look through the other eye. I had no difficulty whatsoever eliciting the corresponding sensation to each one of his commands. I had the perception of growing birds' legs, which were weak and wobbly at first. I felt a tail coming out of the back of my neck, and wings out of my cheekbones. The wings were folded deeply. I felt them coming out by degrees. The process was hard, but not painful. Then I winked my head down to the size of a crow, but the most astonishing effect was accomplished with my eyes, my bird's sight. My eyes actually were capable of having a full view to the side. I could wink one eye at a time and shift the focusing from one eye to the other. Sunday, March 28, 1965 On Thursday, March 18, I smoked again the hallucinogenic mixture. When I awakened, I was lying on my back at the bottom of a shallow irrigation ditch, immersed in water up to my chin. Someone was holding my head up. It was Don Juan. After a while, I was completely awake and got out of the water. You must tell me all you saw, Don Juan said when we got to his house. He also said he had been trying to bring me back for three days and had had a very difficult time doing it. I made numerous attempts to describe what I had seen, but I could not concentrate. Later on, during the early evening, I felt I was ready to talk with Don Juan, and I began to tell him what I remembered from the time I had fallen on my side, but he did not want to hear about it. He said the only interesting part was what I saw and did after he tossed me into the air and I flew away. All I could remember was a series of dreamlike images or scenes. They had no sequential order. I had the impression that each one of them was like an isolated bubble, floating into focus and then moving away. They were not, however, merely scenes to look at. I was inside them. I took part in them. The last scene I remembered was three silvery birds. They radiated a shiny metallic light, almost like stainless steel, but intense and moving and alive. I liked them. We flew together. Don Juan did not make any comments on my recounting. The following conversation took place the next day after the recounting of my experience. Don Juan said... It does not take much to become a crow. You did it, and now you will always be one. What happened after I became a crow, Don Juan? Did I fly for three days? No, you came back at nightfall, as I had told you to. But how did I come back? You were very tired and went to sleep, that's all. I mean, did I fly back? I've already told you. You obeyed me and came back to the house. But don't concern yourself with that matter. It's of no importance. What is important, then? In your whole trip, there was only one thing of great value. The silvery birds. Don Juan demanded that I think about them. About their number, direction of flight, if they had made any noise, at what time of day they came. He said, All this will not mean a damn. It will be only a mad dream unless you remember correctly. I strained myself to recollect, but... I could not. Saturday, April 3, 1965. Days passed, and slowly I was able to recall images of the silvery birds. From this, Don Juan was able to reconstruct the event and to decipher its meaning. They will call you, he said, and as they fly above your head, they will become silvery white. You will see them shining against the sky, and it will mean your time is up. It will mean you are going to die and become a crow yourself. What if I see them during the morning? You won't see them in the morning. But crows fly all day, not your emissaries, you fool. Well, how about your emissaries, Don Juan? Mine will come in the morning. There will also be three of them. My benefactor told me that one could shout them back to black if one does not want to die. But now I know it can't be done. My benefactor was given to shouting and to all the clatter and violence of the devil's weed. I know the smoke is different because he has no passion. He's fair. When your silvery emissaries come for you, there's no need to shout at them. Just fly with them as you have already done. After they have collected you, they will reverse directions, and there will be four of them flying away. 
Saturday, April 10, 1965. I'd been experiencing brief flashes of disassociation or shallow states of non-ordinary reality. Today I discussed this condition with Don Juan. I asked for advice. He seemed to be unconcerned and told me to disregard the experiences because they were meaningless, or rather valueless. He reminded me again that in order to partake of the smoke, it was necessary to lead a strong, quiet life. At this point, I asked Don Juan the unavoidable question. Did I really become a crow? I mean, would anyone seeing me have thought I was an ordinary crow? No. You can't think that way when dealing with the power of the Allies. Such questions make no sense. It takes a very long time to learn to be a proper crow, he said. But you did not change, nor did you stop being a man. There's something else. Well, can you tell me what the something else is, Don Juan? Perhaps by now you know it yourself. Maybe if you were not so afraid of becoming mad or of losing your body, you would understand this marvelous secret. But perhaps you must wait until you lose your fear to understand what I mean. The last event I recorded in my field notes took place in September 1965. It was the last of Don Juan's teachings. I called it a special state of non-ordinary reality because it was not the product of any of the plants I had used before. It seemed that Don Juan elicited it by means of a careful manipulation of cues about himself. That is to say, he behaved in front of me in so skillful a manner that he created the clear and sustained impression that he was not really himself, but someone impersonating him. As a result, I experienced a profound sense of conflict. I wanted to believe it was Don Juan, and yet I could not be sure of it. The concomitant of the conflict was a conscious terror, so acute that it impaired my health for several weeks. Afterward, I thought it would have been wise to end my apprenticeship then. I have never been a participant since that time, yet Don Juan has not ceased to consider me an apprentice. He has regarded my withdrawal only as a necessary period of recapitulation, another step of learning which may last indefinitely. Since that time, however, he has never expounded on his knowledge. Friday, October 29, 1965 On Thursday, September 30, 1965, I went to see Don Juan. The brief, shallow states of non-ordinary reality had been persisting in spite of my deliberate attempts to end them or slough them off as Don Juan had suggested. I felt that my condition was getting worse, for the duration of such states was increasing. My inability to shake it off produced a deep anxiety in me. Don Juan, after listening attentively to all the details, concluded that I was suffering from a loss of soul. I told him I had been having these hallucinations ever since the time I had smoked the mushrooms, but he insisted that they were a new development. He said that earlier I had been afraid and had just dreamed nonsensical things, but that now I was truly bewitched. Don Juan seemed to be overly preoccupied, a state that was quite unusual for him. This naturally increased my apprehension. He said he had no definite idea as to who had trapped my soul, but whoever it was intended without doubt to kill me or make me very ill. Then he gave me precise instructions about a fighting form, a specific bodily position to be maintained while I remained on my beneficial spot. I had to maintain this posture he called a form, una forma para pelear. I asked him what all that was for and whom I was going to fight. He replied that he was going away to see who had taken my soul and to find out if it was possible to get it back. In the meantime, I was supposed to stay on my spot until his return. The fighting form was actually a precaution, he said, in case something happened during his absence, and it had to be used if I was attacked. It consisted of clapping the calf and thigh of my right leg and stomping my left foot in a kind of dance I had to do while facing the attacker. He warned me that the form had to be adopted only in moments of extreme crisis, but so long as there was no danger in sight, I should simply sit cross-legged on my spot. Under circumstances of extreme danger, however, he said I could resort to one last means of defense, hurling an object at the enemy. He told me that ordinarily one hurls a power object, but since I did not possess any, I was forced to use any small rock that would fit into the palm of my right hand, a rock I could hold by pressing it against my palm with my thumb. 
He said that such a technique should be used only if one was indisputably in danger of losing one's life. The hurling of the object had to be accompanied by a war cry, a yell that had the property of directing the object to its mark. He emphatically recommended that I be careful and deliberate about the outcry and not use it at random, but only under severe conditions of seriousness. I asked what he meant by severe conditions of seriousness. He said that the outcry or war cry was something that remained with a man for the duration of his life. Thus it had to be good from the very beginning. And the only way to start it correctly was by holding back one's natural fear and haste until one was absolutely filled with power. And then the yell would burst out with direction and power. He said these were the conditions of seriousness needed to launch the yell. I asked him to explain about the power that was supposed to fill one before the outcry. He said that was something that ran through the body, coming from the ground where one stood. It was a kind of power that emanated from the beneficial spot, to be exact. It was a force that pushed the yell out. If such a force was properly managed, the battle cry would be perfect. I asked him again if he thought something was going to happen to me. He said he knew nothing about it, and admonished me dramatically to stay glued to my spot for as long as it was necessary, because that was the only protection I had against anything that might happen. I began to feel frightened. I begged him to be more specific. He said all he knew was that I should not move under any circumstances. I was not to go into the house or into the bush. Above all, he said, I should not utter a single word, not even to him. He said I could sing my mescalito songs if I became too frightened, and then he added that I knew already too much about these matters to have to be warned like a child about the importance of doing everything correctly. His admonitions produced a state of profound anguish in me. I was sure he was expecting something to happen. I asked him why he recommended that I sing the mescalito songs and what he believed was going to frighten me. He laughed and said I might become afraid of being alone. He walked into the house and closed the door behind him. I looked at my watch. It was 7 p.m. I sat quietly for a long time. There were no sounds coming from Don Juan's room. Everything was quiet. It was windy. I thought of making a dash from my car to get my windbreaker, but I did not dare to go against Don Juan's advice. I was not sleepy but tired. The cold wind made it impossible for me to rest. Four hours later I heard Don Juan walking around the house. I thought he might have left through the back to urinate in the bushes. Then he called me loudly. Hey, boy! Hey, boy, I need you here, he said. I nearly got up to go to him. It was his voice, but not his tone or his usual words. Don Juan had never called me, hey, boy, so I stayed where I was. A chill went up my back. He began to yell again, using the same or a similar phrase. I heard him walking around the back of his house. He stumbled on a woodpile as if he did not know it was there. Then he came to the porch and sat next to the door with his back against the wall. He seemed heavier than usual. His movements were not slow or clumsy, just heavier. He plunked down on the floor instead of sliding nimbly as he usually did. Besides, that was not his spot, and Don Juan would never under any circumstances sit anywhere else. Then he talked to me again. He asked me why I refused to come when he needed me. He talked loudly. I did not want to look at him, and yet I had a compulsive urge to watch him. He began to swing slightly from side to side. I changed my position, adopted the fighting form he had taught me, and turned to face him. My muscles were stiff and strangely tense. I do not know what prompted me to adopt the fighting form, but perhaps it was because I believed Don Juan was deliberately trying to scare me by creating the impression that the person I saw was not really himself. I felt he was very careful about doing the unaccustomed in order to establish doubt in my mind. I was afraid, but still I felt I was above it all, because I was actually taking stock of and analyzing the entire sequence. At that point Don Juan got up. His motions were utterly unfamiliar. He brought his arms in front of his body and pushed himself up, lifting his backside first. Then he grabbed the door and straightened out the top part of his body. I was amazed about how deeply familiar I was with his movements and what an awesome feeling he had created by letting me see a Don Juan who did not move like Don Juan. He took a couple of steps toward me. 
He held the lower part of his back with both hands as if he were trying to straighten up, or as if he were in pain. He whined and puffed. His nose seemed to be stuffed up. He said he was going to take me with him and ordered me to get up and follow him. He walked toward the west side of the house. I shifted my position to face him. He turned to me. I did not move from my spot. I was glued to it. He bellowed, Hey, boy, I told you to come with me. If you don't come, I'll drag you. He walked toward me. I began beating my calf and thigh and dancing fast. He got to the edge of the porch in front of me and nearly touched me. Frantically, I prepared my body to adopt the hurling position, but he changed directions and moved away from me, toward the bushes to my left. At one moment as he was walking away, he turned suddenly, but I was facing him. He went out of sight. I retained the fighting posture for a while longer, but as I did not see him any more, I sat cross-legged again with my back to the rock. By then I was really frightened. I wanted to run away, yet that thought terrified me even more. I felt I would have been completely at his mercy if he had caught me on the way to my car. I began to sing the peyote songs I knew, but somehow I felt they were impotent there. They served only as a pacifier, yet they soothed me. I sang them over and over. About 2.45 a.m. I heard a noise inside the house. I immediately changed my position. The door was flung open and Don Juan stumbled out. He was gasping and holding his throat. He knelt in front of me and moaned. He asked me in a high, whining voice to come and help him. Then he bellowed again and ordered me to come. He made gargling sounds. He pleaded with me to come and help him because something was choking him. He crawled on his hands and knees until he was perhaps four feet away. He extended his hands to me. He said, Come here. Then he got up. His arms were extended toward me. He seemed ready to grab me. I stomped my foot on the ground and clapped my calf and thigh. I was beside myself with fear. He stopped and walked to the side of the house and into the bushes. I shifted my position to face him. Then I sat down again. I did not want to sing any more. My energy seemed to be waning. My entire body ached. All my muscles were stiff and painfully contracted. I did not know what to think. I could not make up my mind whether to be angry at Don Juan or not. I thought of jumping him, but somehow I knew he would have cut me down like a bug. I really wanted to cry. I experienced a profound despair. The thought that Don Juan was going all the way out to frighten me made me feel like weeping. I was incapable of finding a reason for his tremendous display of histrionics. His movements were so artful that I became confused. It was not as if he was trying to move like a woman. It was as if a woman was trying to move like Don Juan. I had the impression that she was really trying to walk and move with Don Juan's deliberation, but was too heavy and did not have the nimbleness of Don Juan. Whoever it was in front of me created the impression of being a younger, heavy woman trying to imitate the slow movements of an agile old man. These thoughts threw me into a state of panic. A cricket began to call loudly, very close to me. I noticed the richness of its tone. I fancied it to have a baritone voice. The call started to fade away. Suddenly my whole body jerked. I assumed the fighting position again and faced the direction from which the cricket's call had come. The sound was taking me away. It had begun to trap me before I realized it was only cricket-like. The sound got closer again. It became terribly loud. I started to sing my peyote songs louder and louder. Suddenly the cricket stopped. I immediately sat down but kept on singing. A moment later I saw the shape of a man running toward me from the direction opposite to that of the cricket's call. I clapped my hands on my thigh and calf and stomped vigorously, frantically. The shape went by very fast, almost touching me. It looked like a dog. I experienced so dreadful a fear that I was numb. I cannot recollect anything else I felt or thought. The morning dew was refreshing. I felt better. Whatever the phenomenon was, it seemed to have withdrawn. It was 5.48 a.m. when Don Juan opened the door quietly and came out. He stretched his arms, yawning, and glanced at me. He took two steps toward me, prolonging his yawning. I saw his eyes looking through half-closed eyelids. I jumped up. I knew then that whoever or whatever was in front of me was not Don Juan. I took a small, sharp-edged rock from the ground. It was next to my right hand. I did not look at it. I just held it by pressing it with my thumb against my extended fingers. I adopted the form Don Juan had taught me. I felt a strange vigor filling me in a matter of seconds. Then I yelled and hurled the rock at him. I thought it was a magnificent outcry. 
At that moment I did not care whether I lived or died. I felt the cry was awesome in its potency. It was piercing and prolonged, and it actually directed my aim. The figure in front wobbled and shrieked and staggered to the side of the house and into the bushes again. It took me hours to calm down. I could not sit any more. I kept on trotting on the same place. I had to breathe through my mouth to take in enough air. At 11 a.m., Don Juan came out again. I was going to jump up, but the movements were his. He went directly to his spot and sat down in his usual familiar way. He looked at me and smiled. He was Don Juan. I went to him, and instead of being angry, I kissed his hand. I really believed then that he had not acted to create a dramatic effect, but that someone had impersonated him to cause me harm or to kill me. The conversation began with speculations about the identity of a female person who had allegedly taken my soul. Then Don Juan asked me to tell him about every detail of my experience. I narrated the whole sequence of events in a very deliberate manner. He laughed all the way as if it were a joke. When I had finished, he said, You did fine. You won the battle for your soul. But this matter is more serious than I thought. Your life wasn't worth two hoots last night. It is fortunate you learned something in the past. Had you not had a little training, you would be dead by now, because whoever you saw last night meant to finish you off. How is it possible, Don Juan, that she could take your form? Very simple. She is a diablera and has a good helper on the other side. But she was not too good in assuming my likeness, and you caught on to her trick. Is a helper on the other side the same as an ally? No. A helper is the aid of a diablero. A helper is a spirit that lives on the other side of the world and helps a diablero to cause sickness and pain. It helps him to kill. Can a diablero also have an ally, Don Juan? It is the diableros who have the allies, but before a diablero can tame an ally, he usually has a helper to aid him in his tasks. Well, how about the woman who took your form, Don Juan? Does she have only a helper and not an ally? I don't know whether she has an ally or not. Some people do not like the power of an ally and prefer a helper. To tame an ally is hard work. It's easier to get a helper on the other side. Do you think I could get a helper? To know that, you have to learn much more. We are again at the beginning, almost as on the first day you came over and asked me to tell you about Mescalito, and I could not because you would not have understood. That other side is the world of Diableros, I think it would be best to tell you my own feelings in the same way my benefactor told me his. He was a diablero and a warrior. His life was inclined toward the force and the violence of the world. But I am neither of them. That is my nature. You have seen my world from the start. As to showing you the world of my benefactor, I can only put you at the door, and you will have to decide for yourself. You will have to learn about it by your effort alone. I must admit now that I made a mistake. It is much better, I see now, to start the way I did myself. Then it is easier to realize how simple and yet how profound the difference is. A diablero is a diablero, and a warrior is a warrior. Or a man can be both. There are enough people who are both. But a man who only traverses the paths of life is everything. Today, I am neither a warrior nor a diablero. For me there is only the traveling on the paths that have a heart, on any path that may have a heart. There I travel, and the only worthwhile challenge for me is to traverse its full length. And there I travel, looking, looking, breathlessly. He paused. His face revealed a peculiar mood. He seemed to be unusually serious. I, I did not know what to ask or to say. He proceeded. The particular thing to learn is how to get to the crack between the worlds and how to enter the other world. There is a crack between the two worlds, the world of the Diableros and the world of living men. There is a place where the two worlds overlap. The crack is there. It opens and closes like a door in the wind. To get there, a man must exercise his will. He must, I should say, develop an indomitable desire for it, a single-minded dedication. 
but he must do it without the help of any power or any man. The man by himself must ponder and wish up to a moment in which his body is ready to undergo the journey. That moment is announced by prolonged shaking of the limbs and violent vomiting. The man usually cannot sleep or eat and wanes away. When the convulsions do not stop, the man is ready to go, and the crack between the worlds appears right in front of his eyes like a monumental door, a crack that goes up and down. When the crack opens, the man has to slide through it. It is hard to see on the other side of the boundary. It is windy like a sandstorm. The wind whirls around. The man then must walk in any direction. It will be a long or a short journey depending on his willpower. A strong-willed man journeys shortly. An undecided, weak man journeys long and precariously. After this journey, the man arrives at a sort of plateau. It is possible to distinguish some of its features clearly. It is a plain above the ground. It is possible to recognize it by the wind, which there becomes even more violent, whipping, roaring all around. On top of that plateau is the entrance to that other world, and there stands a skin that separates the two worlds. Dead men go through it without a noise, but we have to break it with an outcry. The wind gathers strength, the same unruly wind that blows on the plateau. When the wind has gathered enough force, the man has to yell and the wind will push him through. Here his will has to be inflexible too, so that he can fight the wind. All he needs is a gentle shove. He does not need to be blown to the ends of the other world. Once on the other side, the man will have to wander around. His good fortune would be to find a helper nearby, not too far from the entrance. The man has to ask him for help. In his own words, he has to ask the helper to teach him and make him a diablero. When the helper agrees, he kills the man on the spot, and while he's dead, he teaches him. When you make the trip yourself, depending on your luck, you may find a great diablero in the helper who will kill you and teach you. Most of the time, though, one encounters lesser brujos who have very little to teach, but neither you nor they have the power to refuse the best instance is to find a male helper, lest one become the prey of a diablera who will make one suffer in an unbelievable manner. Women are always like that. But that depends on luck alone, unless one's benefactor is a great diablero himself, in which event he will have many helpers in the other world and can direct one to see a particular helper. My benefactor was such a man. He directed me to encounter his spirit helper. After your return, you will not be the same man. You are committed to come back to see your helper often, and you are committed to wander farther and farther from the entrance until finally one day you will go too far and will not be able to return. Sometimes a diablero may catch a soul and push it through the entrance and leave it in the custody of his helper until he robs the person of all his willpower. In other cases, like yours, for instance, the soul belongs to a strong-willed person, and the diablero may keep it inside his pouch because it's too hard to carry otherwise. In such instances, as in yours, a fight may resolve the problem, a fight in which the diablero either wins all or loses all. This time she lost the combat and had to release your soul. Had she won, she would have taken it to her helper for keeps. But how did I win? You did not move from your spot. Had you moved one inch away, you would have been demolished. She chose the moment I was away as the best time to strike, and she did it well. She failed because she did not count on your own nature, which is violent, and also because you did not budge from the spot on which you were invincible. How would she have killed me if I'd moved? <laughs> she would have hit you like a thunderbolt. But above all, she would have kept your soul, and you would have wasted away. What is going to happen now, Don Juan? Nothing. You won your soul back. It was a good battle. You learned many things last night. Afterward, we began to look for the stone I had hurled. He said if we could find it, we could be absolutely sure the affair had ended. We looked for nearly three hours. I had the feeling I would recognize it, but I could not. 
That same day in the early evening, Don Juan took me into the hills around his house. There he gave me long and detailed instructions on specific fighting procedures. At one moment in the course of repeating certain prescribed steps, I found myself alone. I had run up a slope and was out of breath. I was perspiring freely, and yet I was cold. I called Don Juan several times, but he did not answer, and I began to experience a strange apprehension. I heard a rustling in the underbrush as if someone was coming toward me. I listened attentively, but the noise stopped. Then it came again, louder and closer. At that moment it occurred to me that the events of the preceding night were going to be repeated. In a matter of a few seconds my fear grew out of all proportion. The rustle in the underbrush got closer, and my strength waned. I wanted to scream or weep, run away or faint. My knees sagged. I fell to the ground whining. I could not even close my eyes. After that I remember only that Don Juan made a fire and rubbed the contracted muscles of my arms and legs. I remained in a state of profound distress for several hours. Afterward, Don Juan explained my disproportionate reaction as a common occurrence. I said I could not figure out logically what had caused my panic, and he replied that it was not the fear of dying, but rather the fear of losing my soul, a fear common among men who do not have unbending intent. That experience was the last of Don Juan's teachings. Ever since that time I have refrained from seeking his lessons. And although Don Juan has not changed his benefactor's attitude toward me, I do believe that I have succumbed to the first enemy of a man of knowledge.